Five. So I will call to order the March 2nd, 2023 regular meeting of the Hendersonville City Council. We begin our meetings with a silent invocation for people to pray or meditate as they choose, followed by the Pledge of Allegiance. So if you'll rise, please. Thank you. If you'll join me in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Okay. Uh, our public comment, uh, we have one person signed up uh, in person to do it. Uh, is there anyone on uh, line who would like to speak? If they would raise their hand, just so I know how many people we have. Madam Mayor, we have one hand raised. One hand raised, okay. Thank you. We will start with our person who is here in person, and that is Melinda Lawrence. And if you would, when you come to the microphone, just give your name and your address for the clerk's record, please. Melinda Lawrence, 710 First Avenue West. And before I begin, I would like for this to be introduced into the record. Good evening, and thank you, City Council, for um, listening to my um, request. This evening, I'm standing here tonight before the City Council to address an issue in one of our communities. Some weeks ago, no parking signs were installed along the corner of 9th Avenue and Oak Street, Oak Street and Corner Avenue up to Oak and 7th Avenue West. Previously, there was only a no loading or unloading at the corner of 9th Avenue and Oak Street. I realized this was at the request of one of our citizens some times ago due to the school traffic. The parking is causing some issues on Oak Street. We were led to believe that this would not interfere with the parking on the left or right sides in front of our homes. Now we have to park across the street from our addresses on the right coming off of Ninth Avenue. This has created a hardship for some of the residents that live on Oak Street. They have all Almost been some traffic incidents since the new parking enforcement signs, as well as traffic violation tickets have been issued. We would like to know if the city would consider changing these signs to no parking or dropping off during the hours of 7 a.m. and to 9 a.m. and 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. at the corner of 9th Avenue and Oak Street, Oak and Corner Avenue, up to Oak and 7th Avenue West. There are signs of this nature in the Haywood Forest area near Thornton Place and Noble Drive. We would like very much for this council to consider this so that the residents on Oak Street will not be subjected to her such hardship. Thank you for taking the time to listen to our request. Thank you. Uh, Madam Mayor. Yes. We had uh, one individual come in right now who wanted to speak for public comment. Um, Clifford Meeks would like to speak. Okay, in, uh, just, we'll take that in a moment. Um, I think the, the issue of traffic, that's something we'll have to refer to staff to have them look at and uh, come back with a recommendation for us. It's not, nothing we can change this evening, but we will be looking at that. Okay. Okay. <coughs> Go ahead. And again, if you would give your name and address for the clerk's record, please. Good evening. <coughs> Excuse me. Good evening, one and all. My name is Clifford Meek, M-E-E-K, and I'm over on Wilkins Street, 805 Wilkins Street. That's over in Lenox Park. I'd like to come before you this, after, this evening to uh, talk about our railroad depot in downtown Hendersonville. 
Um, excuse me. Um, Raleigh and North Carolina DOT Transportation, Department of Transportation are looking for railroad events to publicize passenger rail service to Western North Carolina. Although Hendersonville is not on the scheduled route, we have a fine <coughs> historic depot that gets very little recognition either locally or regionally. And I'd like to maybe convince you to maybe celebrate the coming of the rail, <coughs> excuse me, rail service to Hendersonville that came through in July 4th, 1879, I believe. So that little depot has been standing, not that one, but we've had rail service for 144 years. <clears throat> North Carolina DOT has a rail engine called the city of Asheville, currently in service between Charlotte and Raleigh every day. If we're able to get something like that up here to celebrate the rail passenger depot for July 4th would be an ideal situation. I've talked to the depot, guys in the depot, and I talked to a John Pisano, club, the club president, and he, he's all for it. Mr. Pisano has stepped aside at the new election, and Robert Wright is now in charge. And I've got his name on here as reference. If the city could coordinate with them and maybe bring NCDOT down here, July 4th, I have five copies of my little proposal. So would, I, would that be enough for five members? Mm -hmm. I'll answer any questions. I think this is something we'll have to get some more information on. Pardon me? And we'll we'll have to get some more information on it. And it looks like you have it for us. Okay. Yes, to you. Yeah, you can bring that. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Very good. Thank you. Okay, uh, if the person online would like to speak now. Crystal Colley, you are unmuted. Hi, this is Crystal Colley. Uh, my address I'll give is 702 Carolina Avenue, Hendersonville. And I am the founder of Black History Collective of Henderson County, North Carolina. I would like to thank the city of Hendersonville and especially Allison Justice for the Black History Month landmark post that was published on the city's city government's Facebook page during the month of February 2023. Thank you for preserving history and recognizing the achievements and contributions that black citizens of Hendersonville has made. And I hope that this will happen each year. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Um, the, the thanks for that goes to our, uh, our communications staff for pulling all of that together. Right. Okay. We uh, now go on to the business portion, a consideration <coughs> of the agenda. Is there anything that uh, should be removed from or added to the agenda? I think there are a couple of items to be removed. Mayor Volk, uh, we'd like to remove item 5G from the consent agenda, uh, which is the memorandum of understanding with Henderson County for additional review. Remove 5G, please. And also re remove item 6A, which is a proclamation that will be presented at a later date. Okay. Anything else from council? Not a motion to approve the remain uh, the agenda as amended. Madam Mayor, I move that city council approve the agenda as amended. 
Is there any discussion? If not, those in favor of approving the agenda as amended say aye. 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 Those opposed say no. Ayes have it. And uh, we have our agenda. Consent agenda, the one item was removed. Is there anything else that uh, would you would like to have moved from the consent agenda to the regular agenda so it can be discussed? Or if not, a motion to approve the remaining items. Madam Mayor, I move that the City Council approve the consent agenda as amended. Thank you. Is there any discussion? If not, those in favor of approving the remaining items on the consent agenda say aye. Aye. Those opposed say no. Ayes have it. You got that. Okay. Presentations. The first one, the uh, Meals on Wheels, will be done at a special event at the Council on Aging in a couple of weeks. But we have three we have left to do. So, we'll come out here. And the first one is American Red Cross Month. If you guys want to come up. proclamation for American Red Cross Month. Whereas the American Red Cross is a humanitarian organization that eases people's suffering during life's emergencies in Hendersonville, North Carolina and across the United States and around the world. And whereas the American Red Cross chapter serving Western North Carolina, it has a long history of helping our neighbors in need by delivering shelter, care, and humanitarian <coughs> disasters, making our communities safer through its life-saving home fire training, <coughs> providing life-saving blood, teaching skills that save lives, and supporting military, veterans, and their families. And whereas we thank and honor the selfless volunteers, dedicated employees, and generous supporters who make this compassionate work possible. And whereas last year in Western North Carolina, 223 active volunteers helped 200 households affected by 181 local disasters, trained 8,289 people in first aid, CPR, and AED, babysitting, and other life-saving skills, collected more than 23,871 units of blood, and served 454 military members, veterans, and their <coughs> families. And whereas people in our community depend on the American Red Cross, whose life-saving mission is powered by the devotion of volunteers, generosity of donors, and partnership of community organizations. Now, therefore, I, Barbara G. Volk, Mayor of the City of Hendersonville, by virtue of the authority vested in me by the Constitution and laws of Hendersonville, North Carolina, do hereby proclaim March 2023 as Red Cross Month. We dedicate the month of March to all those who support its vital work to prevent and alleviate human suffering in the face of emergencies. I encourage all Americans to support this organization and its noble humanitarian mission. So, Thank you. congratulations. And you want to say something? Good. Good sure. Um, this blood drive on the 20th, we can sure to use you. Um, right around the corner. Right around the corner at the Red Cross office. Um, there are shortages. We really do need you to support that part of Red Cross. And to maybe take a minute to go to redcross.org and see what all we really do. We do a lot of stuff that people don't understand in terms of services to the armed forces, um, disasters and um, the international services that we provide with uh, reuniting families, and uh, there's a lot there. And thank you very much. I just want to say, BJ uh, has been with Red Cross now. We, she just got an award for 60 years as a volunteer. <laughs> and uh, she is also the uh, most recent recipient of the Presidential Award from National Red Cross just, uh, just this year as well. As you know, Red Cross, uh, I'm a volunteer as well. 95%, 99% of everything Red Cross does is by volunteers. So as BJ says, go to redcross.org, just click that little volunteer button if you have some time, 
or that donate button on the other, uh, the other <laughs> side if you have some time as well. But thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next, um, Henderson County Youth Council for the We Are Hope Week. Who all is coming up here? Okay, thank you for being here. Um, whereas substance and alcohol abuse negatively affects many areas of the brain, the liver, the heart, and other body parts, and can cause adverse behavioral, psychological, and social consequences. And whereas there were more than 63,000 drug overdose deaths in the United States in 2016, and the drug overdose death rate has more than tripled from 1999 to 2016. And whereas substance and alcohol abuse continues to occur among children and youth in our society. In 1917, 12.1% of high school students in North Carolina smoked cigarettes. 44.1% used an electronic vape product. 26.5% drank alcohol. 36.5% used marijuana. 5.3% used cocaine. And 15% took prescription drugs without a doctor's prescription, according to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention's 2017 Youth Risk Behavior Surve Surveillance. And whereas student leaders in Henderson County Public Schools, six high schools and four middle schools, have joined with local Henderson County Hope Coalition in educating their peers on alcohol, tobacco, marijuana, and pre prescription drug use and abuse. <coughs> and whereas students at Apple Valley Middle, Flat Rock Middle, Hendersonville Middle, Rugby Middle, each Henderson, East Henderson High, Henderson County Early College High, Hendersonville High, North Henderson High, and West Henderson High are pledging to be and remain substance free. Now therefore be it resolved, I, Barbara G. Volk, Mayor of the City of Hendersonville, by virtue of the authority vested in me, proclaim February 27th to March 3rd, be observed in Henderson County Public Schools, Middle Schools, and High Schools, as we are hope Substance Abuse Awareness Week. So, congratulations, you get this. Yeah. You want to say anything? Okay. Anything? <laughs> okay, so are you, you still uh, hanging the banners tomorrow? Yes, we will be hanging the banners tomorrow at the historic courthouse. If the weather turns into a weather event, which we've been warned about, we will be Okay. Uh, but it will still be so at <coughs> noon tomorrow, right? Noon tomorrow. Okay. So if anyone wants to come down and, and participate in that, Fair thank well. you. <coughs> okay. Next, year of the trail. <coughs> okay. Year of the trail, 2023. Whereas the city of Hendersonville's natural beauty is critical to its residents' quality of life, health and economic well-being, and whereas the trails that span across our community are an integral part of the recreational and transportation possibilities of our area and promote an enjoyment of scenic beauty by our residents and our visitors, and whereas the parks, greenways, trails, and natural areas in our community are welcoming to all and provide a common ground for people of all ages, abilities, and backgrounds to access our rich, and diverse natural, cultural, and historic resources. And whereas trails offer quality of life benefits to all as expressions of local community character and pride, as outdoor workshops for science education, as tools for economic revitalization, as free resources for healthy recreation, as accessible alternative transportation, and as sites for social and cultural events. And whereas, Nature trails with the community vary from the Oklawaha Greenway, or maybe Oklawaha Greenway, we'll see, <laughs> along Mud Creek to be soon completed, uh, to the soon to be completed Clear Creek Greenway and Henderson County's Acousta Trail, to natural service and paved trails within our parks and green spaces. 
And whereas the North Carolina General Assembly designated 2023 as the year of the trail in North Carolina to promote and celebrate the state's extensive network of trails that showcase our state's beauty, vibrancy, and culture. And whereas North Carolina is known as the great trail state. Now therefore be it resolved by the city council of the city of Hendersonville, North Carolina, that city council does hereby proclaim 2023 as the year of the trail in the city of Hendersonville and commend its observance to all the people. All right. <laughs> Want to say anything more about it? Uh, nothing other than I'll make sure that our local trail advocates get this and okay. uh, we live in a great place. It's been a pleasure to work on a couple of the trails that you yeah. named and look forward to more coming soon. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Well, we will now start our public hearings. And the first one is an annexation, the cottages at Mastermind. Mr. Morrow. Good evening, Madam Mayor, member of City Council. Uh, so, yeah, so the city is in receipt of a contigu uh, contiguous annexation petition. At the February 8th meeting, City Council accepted the City Clerk's Certificate of Sufficiency for this petition. Uh, the annexation petition was submitted by the property owners, the Ham Hammond Family Trust and John and Betty Hammond. The annexation application is for two parcels that include approximately 12.76 acres on Francis Road and Mastermind Lane. And this annexation is tied to the cottages at Mastermind Project. Um, the, the map on the right, you will see the red line that depicts the current city of Hendersonville city limits. Um, here's the draft motions of approval and denial. Uh, I also have the annexation plan available if you would all like to see that or have any questions. Um, if you all have, do have any questions, I'd be happy to answer those. Does anyone have any questions? No. Okay, thank you. Um, <coughs> uh, Madam Attorney, has this public hearing been advertised in accordance with general statutes? Yes, Mayor, it has. So we will open this public hearing. Is there a, anyone who wishes to speak regarding the annexation of uh, the cottages at Mastermind request? Anyone who wishes to speak? Okay. Is there anyone online seeking recognition? Madam Mayor, we have one hand raised. Okay, if that person would like to speak. Ken Fitch, you are uh, unmuted. Fitch. Yeah, Ken Fitch, 1046 Patton Street. Just one question. Uh, when this project was presented to you for consideration previously, uh, an outstanding issue was sewer connection. And the question uh, is, um, well, th there was the possibility of an easement or a city action that was at issue. And I just wonder whether that uh, question has been resolved at this point. Thank you. Can, do you have an answer for that? Yeah. So, so I, I, I can say that they've not submitted their final site plans for this project yet. Um, I'm assuming this annexation is a preemptive um, move on their part in order to get sewer. Now granted, they've not submitted their final plans, so those details have not been worked out as of now. Okay, thank you. Anyone else who wishes to speak? If not, we'll close that public hearing. Okay. Council, discussion or a motion? Madam Mayor, I'm the City Council adopt an ordinance of the City of Hendersonville to extend the corporate limits of the city as a contiguous as a contiguous annexation to annex that property owned by the Hammond Family Trust and John and Betty Hammond, identified as pins 9579482415 and 9579486832, finding that the standards established by the North Carolina General Statute 160A-31 have been satisfied and that the annexation is in the best interest of the city. 
Is there any discussion? If not, those in favor of the annexation petition say aye. 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 Those opposed say no. Ayes have it, and that one is taken care of. Thank you. Uh, next, it's a subdivision text amendment. Changes to expedited and minor subdivisions. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, members of City Council, so this one may take a little bit longer than that one did. Mm -hmm. um, so the city is in receipt of an application for a subdivision text amendment that is for your review today. The applicant is John Lively. He is proposing that the city reduce the number of required acres to be reviewed as an expedited subdivision from five acres to more than two acres. Um, I'll speak a little bit more in detail on what an expedited subdivision is in my next slide, but some of the reasoning that the applicant provided for these changes were to remove the upfront infrastructure costs associated with uh, being reviewed as a minor subdivision, um, allow for more infill development, provide property owners with the ability to create low impact subdivisions through a streamlined process. Um, in Mr. Lively's case, he lives on a privately maintained gravel road in the ETJ with well water and a septic system in order to provide or subdivide his 3.16 acres into three lots um, he would have been required to be reviewed as a minor subdivision under the current ordinance uh, minor subdivisions must uh, connect to public water and sanitary sewer which would have also required mr lively extending both of these utilities to his property neither of which currently serve his property um, as a result connecting to those um, public infrastructure um, that public infrastructure um, he would have been required to annex into the city of Hendersonville for that sewer connection uh, minor subdivisions must also be served by an NC DOT maintained roadway or right-of-way um, and Blythewood Drive where his house or property is located uh, is privately maintained gravel road so he would have been required to build a street to NC stand NC DOT standards and dedicate it to NC DOT for maintenance um, the continuation of that public street would also require him to be then um, subject to major subdivision requirements. So s beyond what Mr. Lively is proposing, staff is or requesting some additional changes outside of his request. Um, as staff has reviewed more subdivisions under the current regulations adopted in 2020, we've kind of found a trend of smaller subdivisions that never actually get platted. Uh, staff have found kind of this, for lack of a better word, a donut hole for properties that are between two and five acres um, that actually never get subdivided. Uh, properties under two acres into not more than three lots can be reviewed as an exempt subdivision and which are exempted from the subdivision ordinance by state statute. Uh, properties over five acres into not more than three lots can be reviewed as an expedited subdivision which are a special, a special review process that the state law outlines. Uh, so this leaves subdivisions of three lots uh, between two and five acres to follow the subdivision ordinance, which requires a variety of infrastructure improvements prior to the conveyance of any lot. So this would require that they build this infrastructure or bond it before they can actually sell any of the lots and plat the subdivision. So all that, so what is an expedited subdivision? So expedited subdivision review was created by the North Carolina General Assembly in 2017. Uh, review procedures for expedited subdivisions can be found in 160D-802 B and C. The language on the screen um, is exactly word for word what um, the state law outlines for uh, exempt sub or expedited subdivisions. And number five is kind of the important one, even though they only require certain um, of certain plats for, or a plat for rec uh, recordation, those are the, uh, the items that they have to meet. So expedited subdivisions are not an exemption in the traditional sense, but more of a review channel for subdivisions meeting specific criteria. Subdivisions meeting the criteria outlined in the above general statute must be reviewed as an expedited subdivision. Outside of Mr. Lively's request to amend the minimum required acreage, like I mentioned, staff is proposing some additional changes. Uh, the additional changes are to align with the current ordinance um, with, general assembly, with the general statutes. The general statute states that cities may only require a plat to be recorded. 
Uh, this means we cannot require other outside permits and certifications such as our ordinance currently outlines. And the same way with the uh, letter C about ingress and egress. I'll get into that in a lot more detail here in just a second. So on the screen is, you'll see Mr. Lively's proposed text amendment. As you'll see, it's just changing the words at least five and changing that to more than two acres. That was the only change that Mr. Lively had proposed. So now we're going to get into staff's recommendations for changes. Um, so this first slide, you'll see where staff starts off proposing the additional change in the first sentence or in the first section. Um, this is a small clarifying thing where it removes the word small because in reality, expedited subdivisions could be 100, 100 acres into three lots. And as the ordinance is currently written, we think that it could be kind of misleading to say that they're all going to be small because in theory, that, that's not a reality. So we wanted to strike that language. And then as you can see, Mr. Lively's request in there as well. So moving on, this is really just a cleanup of the table that's in the ordinance and making sure it has the correct headings and department name. And also in the second section, you can kind of see that we are removing the um, restricted covenants and deed restrictions just because we are just requiring a plat for these subdivisions. So go on to this slide. Um, kind of the same thing that I'd mentioned. This is, we currently require that they provide um, on-site wastewater system and um, on-site uh, water for each lot to be proven before uh, they subdivide. So we, I don't think we can, we can't technically require that just because they are required to just have just a plat. So that is also just to align with state law. Um, so going through, the same thing with these, um, with this section. We're just pulling out the things where we're currently requiring more than what we're um, allowed to require under state statutes. And then the last thing you see in green is the addition to where the, the lots no longer have to be served by NCDOT maintained roadways or right of ways. Uh, we are aligning that with state law as well and just adding the language from the state that they have to have a permanent means of ingress and egress for each recorded lot. So if we change the expedited subdivision requirements, we also kind of have to um, change the minor subdivision or yeah, minor subdivision requirements as well. So minor subdivisions are now anything four to eight lots with that, um, that doesn't change the roadways. And then we're just while we're in there changing the development assistance department to the community development department. So here we are. Um, so this section starts the comprehensive plan consistency uh, section of the presentation. So I won't go through all the different aspects, but I will touch on some key points like goal LU-1 to encourage infill development that utilizes existing infrastructure in order to maximize public investment and re revitalize existing neighborhoods. Uh, action LU-3-2-3.2.1 Discourage satellite annexations unless they significantly advance the comprehensive plan goals and strategies. This action is important because we currently require all minor subdivisions to extend utilities to serve their properties, which would require annexation for sewer connections that are outside the city limits. Uh, same thing for population and housing. Uh, it's worth mentioning that PH 2.1.1, which states amend zoning and or subdivision standards to require and or offer incentives for variation in lot and unit sizes within a single development. Uh, most of the information from the comprehensive plan that is relevant to this amendment is included in the land use and population and housing chapters. The only relevant strategy um, from this chapter could potentially be they promote investment adjacent to historic neighborhoods through, through compatible infill development, particularly currently underutilized or non-historic properties. That's really the only one that could be put with that. So moving on, the compatibility proposed text amendment allows property owners to subdivide their property while requiring that all resulting lots meet all zoning standards for which is located. This requires that the new lots be in conformance with existing lots within that zoning district 
Um, the decrease of available housing stock has further, um, has further the affordable housing crisis. Cities are tasked with finding new and creative ways of fostering compatible infill development while managing growth. The added flexibility provided by this text amendment <coughs> further, furthers property owners' rights with their land while limiting the impact to the overall community. And the proposed text amendment allows property owners the flexibility to create low impact subdivisions without compromising community safety or functionality. The allowance of more infill development will aid in the ongoing need for affordable housing. Uh, public facilities, the change to allow subdivisions of up to three lots on no more than or on more than two acres to be reviewed as an expedited subdivision rather than a minor subdivision does not force citizens to extend public utilities to areas where the city is not ready to do so by allowing citizens to connect to private wastewater and potable water sources. The city is not forced to grow and maintain their utilities in areas that they're not ready to serve. And effect on natural environment, so there is there aren't any direct connections between this text amendment and the environment and such natural resource section. However, even if subdivided, uh, the subject properties will have to meet any applicable zoning, natural resource, stormwater, flood, floodplain, or other requirements when developed. So the Planning Board's Legislative Committee took this up at their January 17th member or meeting. We had one member in attendance. Uh, we discussed the potential impacts, the reasoning, state statute alignment, there was no motion made by the committee, but committee member Brown did voice his support of the change. This went to planning board in February. Um, all eight members in attendance voted in favor. They did have some discussion points They One of the main points that they touched on was that the newness of this ordinance, as we're working through it, we kind of see some of the holes that we didn't originally see or some hardships that could be there. And just working through those as we work through um, <clears throat> the newness of this ordinance and kind of explain the threshold and why it's more than two acres, the differences between exempt and expedited subdivisions, annexation requirements, and then also what permanent means of ingress and egress could mean and what the city could require to review those. On the screen is the planning board's uh, comprehensive plan consistency statement. It states it promotes compatible infill development and the need to amend the zoning and or subdivision standards to require and or offer incentives for variation in lot size. The planning board's rationale for approval is also shown on your screen and was on your packet. Here is draft rationale for denial of the text amendment and I'm happy to answer any questions y'all may have. Okay, any questions? Okay, thank you. Madam Attorney, has this public hearing been advertised in accordance with general statutes? Yes, Mayor, it has. Thank you. We'll open this public hearing. Is there anyone who wishes to speak regarding this subdivision text amendment? Is there anyone online wishing to uh, comment? Madam Mayor, we have one hand raised. Okay, we will call on that person, please. Lynn, you are unmuted. Unmuted. Good evening, Lynn Williams, Chadwick Avenue. I just wanted to make one point about this, and that was the property next door to us was broken down into three houses, uh, three lots, and the city council were very thankful that they had the oversight to be able to save the vegetative buffer and the above ground swell. And my only concern here on this is if the oversight is receded, and you know, more trees get torn down, we can't track the canopy loss. So I'm just asking if there's some way to have some oversight into the environmental protections, that would be the goal here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, all all uh, requirements of the zoning ordinance still apply. Correct. Correct. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Right. Anyone else who wishes to comment? If not, we'll close that public hearing. Council comments or a motion? Madam Mayor, I move that the City Council adopt 
an ordinance amending the official city of Hendersonville subdivision ordinance section 2204 two reviewing proce procedures by revi revising subsection F expedited subdivisions and sub subsection one minor minor subdivisions based on the following the petition is is found to be consistent with the city of hendersonville 2030 comprehensive plan based on the information from the from the staff's analysis and the public hearing and because the petition aligns the comprehensive plan goals to promote compatible infield development strategy ph-1 um period that uh, one excuse me and the amended um the amended zoning and or subdivision standards are required or offer incentives for variation in the lot size we find this petition to in, well injunction conjunction excuse me with the recommendations presented by staff to be re reasonable and in public interest based on the information from the staff's analysis analysis and the public hearing and because one the proposed text amendment creates flexibility for property owners while still um, limiting potential impacts to the greater community two the proposed text amendment removes additional obstacles to to accomplish less impactful um, infield developments three the proposed text amendment could create opportunities for additional housing stock to be available for residents thank you is there any discussion <clears throat> Not those in favor of the subdivision text amendment say aye. Aye. Those opposed say no. Ayes have it, and that one has been changed. Thank you. Okay. Next, we have a uh, standard rezoning Signal Hill. Yes. Good evening, Madam Mayor, members of City Council. I have three items for you tonight, so we'll get started with this first one, the Signal Hill rezoning. This is a standard rezoning um, for 13 acres located off of Signal Hill Road um, at Amazing Grace Lane and La Follette Street. The applicant is uh, uh, First Victory, uh, with Travis Fowler, and they are proposing to rezone this property from R20 to R15, and uh, we'll get into some of the details of that request. Taking a look at the current land use area around the subject property contains a wide range of uses from low density residential to multifamily apartments and big box retail. The subject parcel is zoned R20, uh, as are the adjacent parcels to the west that are located north of Signal Hill and east of Clear Creek. Further west uh, towards the intersection um, of Duncan Hill Road are the parcels approved for the Duncan Terrace multifamily uh, project. And the parcels abutting the subject property to the east is Signal Hill or Signal Ridge Apartments. This is uh, these are both um, contain affordable housing. Um, the across Signal Hill Road from the subject property are commercial zoning districts, including C3 and PCD. This is a quick comparison of the two districts. Very similar, uh, identical uh, uses. Uh, the only real difference is in the dimensional standards uh, related to the uh, minimum lot size and some slight variations in the setbacks. Taking a look at the site, this is uh, a, an image facing north uh, from Amazing Grace Lane looking up um, Signal Hill. And this is from the same location looking south on Signal Hill from Amazing Grace Lane. And then this is, on the bottom left is an image looking up La Follette Street in towards the site. This is from Signal Hill. Uh, so these would be the access points uh, to the property. And then upper left or on the left side is the um, kind of a snapshot of the interior of the property. Uh, uh, this is what a, a typical view is. It's very um, uh, kind of scrubby land with some pine trees. Um, 
uh, that's that's the current condition of the land. And on the right, you can see the Signal Ridge apartments kind of through the trees there, and that's from Amazing Grace Lane. Taking a look at the future land use map, uh, you can see that most of the subject property is designated as high intensity neighborhood. This designation is prevalent for most of the parcels fronting Signal Hill Road, as well as for parcels to the east and northeast of the subject property. One parcel of the subject property located furthest from Signal Hill Road is designated as medium intensity neighborhood and land further to the west and northwest is also designated as medium intensity neighborhood. Properties to the south of Signal Hill Road are designated as regional activity center as are most of the properties in vicinity of US 64 and Four Seasons Boulevard. The subject property is less than a half mile walk to the activity node centered around the uh, Thompson Street uh, US 64 uh, intersection. So taking a look at comprehensive plan consistency, our first criteria, in this case, there is a split uh, future land use designation between the high intensity uh, neighborhood found closer to Signal Hill Road and the medium intensity uh, located further uh, towards the rear of the property. Uh, the proposed zoning is consistent with the lower intensity designation of medium intensity, but the uh, requested R15 does not permit as high of density as is called for in the high intensity neighborhood, which it calls for eight, you know, eight <coughs> units per acre or greater. Um, looking at the growth management designation for the site, it is also split along the same lines. Um, priority infill area and preservation enhancement area. Um, the uh, goal LU1 uh, of the land use and development chapter talks about encouraging infill development that utilizes existing infrastructure. Um, it goes on to encourage infill development and redevelopment in areas planned for high intensity development as indicated by the priority infill areas. The population and housing chapter also promotes compatible infill development, promotes safe and walkable neighborhoods, and encourages mixed land use patterns that place residents within walking distance of services. The natural and environmental resources uh, has a few goals that are relevant, preserve environmentally sensitive areas in order to protect life and property from natural hazards, protect water resources and preserve natural habitat. And there's some strategies related to that. Um, looking at the other chapters, there were no goals, uh, strategies or actions that were applicable under the cultural and historic resources nor the community facilities chapter. The water resources chapter states uh, to prevent development of floodplains and stream corridors in order to preserve natural drainage patterns and improve quality of stormwater runoff. There is a stream uh, cherry branch at the very rear of this property. Um, and then lastly, the transportation and circulation chapter calls for a, a potential minor thoroughfare at the rear of the site, actually running along um, cherry branch. And so I'm just pointing that out there. That's uh, a, a, a proposal from our comprehensive plan from um, that was included in the 2009 comprehensive plan. Moving on to compatibility, the second criteria, uh, in this case there are a wide range of uses in the area from low density residential to multifamily and big box. The third criteria considered is change conditions. In this case, uh, I mentioned the uh, Duncan Terrace project that was approved and could be built uh, in the future is 132 unit multifamily development approved last June. The fourth criteria considered is public interest. In this case, the rezoning could allow for residential infill development on currently vacant land and uh, potentially provide for additional housing, which utilizes existing infrastructure. Um, and uh, public facilities, there would need to be um, improved street access to, to the property. Signal Hill Road is uh, NCDOT maintained. Uh, it's designated as a local street. That potentially that that classification could um, change in our next comprehensive plan uh, or comprehensive transportation plan the sixth criteria is the effect on natural environment um, in this case the property is vacant and I, I mentioned it is um, has invasive plants kind of scrubby thorny uh, plants and primarily as pine trees there is a small I mentioned the creek at the rear There's also a small blue line stream shown on the property uh, near La Follette Street that would have to be uh, considered as well with any future development. The Planning Board recommended approval of this and adopted a comprehensive consistency statement 
comprehensive plan consistency statement, which is shown on the screen. They also uh, you, you, uh, base their decision on the rationale for approval that is listed on the, the screen. Um, and then we also have the draft uh, rationale for denial, should you need it. And with that, I'll open it up for any questions. Questions? I have one. I know you told us <clears throat> the difference in density between the two. Um, as it's currently zoned, how many units could be cons constructed by right? Uh, so the best way to do that, and I thought I had this on my screen. T Tyler, you might have to help me out. Two point. It's, it's 2.5 2 versus 2.5 and 3.75. So you're 13, <clears throat> 13 acres. Uh, what, what is it? 32 and a half under the current zoning. Okay. 48 under the R15. So about half again as many. That's great. Okay. That's based on the minor PRD allowed densities. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Okay, thank you. Madam Attorney, has this public hearing been advertised in accordance with general statutes? Yes, I'm here it has. Okay, we will open this public hearing. Is there anyone present who wishes to speak? Either in favor or against? Anyone who wishes to speak? Is there anyone online seeking recognition? Yes, Madam Mayor, we have one hand raised. Okay, if you would call on that person, please. Ken Fitch, you are unmuted. Hey, Ken Fitch, 1046 Patton Street. Uh, the item before you presents a question. What action will the rezoning gener generate? Then, of course, we do not know the answer. The, the larger area here has been brought to council attention before with approval of projects that parcel by parcel have altered perhaps unexpectedly the original character of the area as a stretch of formerly forested parcels that were components of a rural ecosystem that traditionally provided habitat for a wide range of wildlife. Unforgettable some years back was the impassioned testimony of a neighbor to this property with a plea to protect the forested ridge where hawks were seen to nest in the tall canopy trees. <clears throat> Hawks had not been faring so well recently, losing their nesting sites and prey as track by tract of habitat disappear and remaining parcels are at risk. And indeed, with the situation here, we may be left with a hawk less property, as well as some other cumulative loss we should not ignore. A primary change for the rezoning here would be the permissibility of smaller lots to accommodate a greater number of structures. And on smaller lots, fewer existing trees might remain, if any at all, and indeed a clear cut might be imminent, along with further depletion of tree canopy, an issue of concern. The consideration of rezoning here has raised further issues of the Available of, availability of sewer connection where the existing residents are on septic and the presence of wetland on the property. And Mr. Shanahan has alerted us to the importance of such an issue, something we and the applicant would need to consider. With the action tonight, uh, city staff who had to negotiate the thorns on site may have to soon negotiate the thorns of the ordinance. The action is more than procedural. It is potentially a significant alteration of neighborhood, terrain, and traditional character that should not be taken lightly. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Fitch. Anyone else? Okay, we did receive one digital comment. 
which I will read. This is from Virginia Haynes, 150 Brevard Noel Drive, Hendersonville. It says, Good evening, City Council. My name is Virginia Haynes, and my husband, Dwayne, and I live adjacent to the proposed development on Sing Signal Hill Road. My husband and I are one of several homeowners in the area who are affected by the growth in the area we have called home for almost 30 years. We have many concerns about this development. However, I will limit this to a few. One, does the city mean to eliminate all natural landscaping in and around the city? The recent growth within the city and surrounding ETJ have taken from the natural beauty of our city. As we lose trees and natural habitat, Hendersonville loses its beauty. Two, the approximate 13 acres of land proposed for development in the Signal Hill project is home to deer, fox, wolf, and an annual hawk nestling. We enjoy watching turkey and other smaller wildlife, including a few white squirrels. Where will these animals move to? Three, Signal Hill Road was not built for the amount of traffic that currently travels from 25 to Thompson Street. With the addition of Signal Hill Apartments, mini storage, apartments coming in the summer near the WHKP Tower, and the new homes on Clear Creek Road, it is unsafe. The road stays in poor condition because it was not built for the 18-wheel trucks that now use the road every time traffic is delayed on 26. Traffic to and from the landfill from across the eastern part of the county leaves the road littered with bags of trash. Potholes constantly form, and it is impossible at certain times to pull out of our road. Four, the proposed increase to medium density development will add a substantial amount of stormwater runoff. With the number of roofs, roads, driveways, etc., this runoff will directly impact all of the surrounding property, including ours and all of the Cherry <coughs> Creek Basin. We do not want our backyard flooded every time it rains, making that portion of our property unusable. Five, finally, we have large permanent silt ponds at the new auto body shop, Signal Hill Apartments, the mini storage, and I assume one will be required at the new large apartment complex at the corner of Signal Hill and North Main Clear Creek. We are surrounded by stagnant water breeding, breeding mosquitoes. Please consider the homeowners that have been your neighbors for many years. There are seven property owners with over two acre lots. There is an established neighborhood between Amazing Grace Lane and La Follette, and there are several homeowners with third acre lots. We choose to live in the, this beautiful part of the county. As we, we become surrounded by high and medium density complexes, we hope you will protect the natural beauty, the wildlife, the safety of an overused road, the sanitation and the value of our homes by denying the rezoning and allowing the low density zoning to remain in place to help limit these issues. Okay, anyone else seeking recognition or here wishing to speak? Hmm? Madam Mayor, we have one, one hand more? raised. Lynn, you are unmuted. Thank you for your time. Lynn Williams, Chadwick Avenue. Once again, my concern here is for the trees on site, the forested lot, the animal habitat, and the loss of that. With Duncan Terrace approved for a clear cut almost across the street, it is an annihilation of the habitat and forest out in that direction. Asking for more oversight and to please protect our canopy in alignment with the memo of the tree board to please preserve at least 30% of our canopy. Thank you. Okay, thank you. All right, there are no more. Oh, yes, okay, yeah, please. Hi, I'm Travis Fowler, First Victory. We're the applicant for the rezoning application and thank you for hearing our application this evening. Specifically, the reason for the change in density from R20 to R15 is to allow us to move the, uh, the development for, further on up into the project and away from the larger canopy trees 
the uh, stream that exists on the back of the property. We will have to still make a sewer connection along uh, Cherry Creek, but specifically the reason for this uh, change in zoning is to lessen the impact, the cost of the uh, development per lot on the houses to bring the cost of the houses down to a more affordable range. Um, so uh, we hear everyone's concerns related to the environment and I have actually seen the hawks. They're nesting on the other side of the creek, by the way. Um, but we're very concerned about all those issues. My consulting engineer and I made the decision based on uh, help from staff that a simple rezoning application would give us the density required to make this project move forward as opposed to a CZD application, which would have surely clear cut the site. Um, and, and so that's, that's why we're asking for a rezoning instead of a CZD uh, residential uh, application. Okay. All right, thank you. Thank you. All right. Is that, is that all? Okay. We will close that public hearing. Council, do you have any questions, comments? I have a question, actually. Mm -hmm. um, didn't we restrict uh, transfer trucks at one point on another road out there from uh, that part of? Actually, I believe the county requested DOT to restrict uh, trucks of certain tonnage on the other side of um, is that Balfour or Berkeley Road? Whatever the road on the other side of Signal Hill, um, on the other side of Clear Creek in Maine, not on this particular section of Signal Hill. There's no truck restrictions currently. Is that something we could look at doing? Uh, certainly City Council could make that request to DOT. I just wanted to say I know that I have been in a meeting in which uh, Commissioner Lapsley discussed that they negotiated with their transfer company not to have them travel that route. In fact, I think they renegotiated the contract uh -huh. I thought so that, that they would stay on 64. Now, <coughs> I know he he talked about that in the RTEC meeting uh -huh. um, very specifically as it related to the transfer truck traffic. So I think the county's contract says they're supposed to go 64 to 25. Okay. Well, if that's something that we could look into or just see what was already established and make sure that they're following through just to lessen the burden on the neighbors out there. So. Anything else? Any other questions, comments, or a motion? I'll just comment that I, for me, this is probably the, the limit of increase in density that, that I'm okay with, but anything more than this is too much. Okay. <clears throat> Ready? Madam Mayor, I move City Council adopt an ordinance amending the official zoning map of the City of Hendersonville, changing the zoning designation of the subject properties pins 9579-0657-9579-065791-9579-068507-9579-068508-9579-068317 and 9579-068117 from R20 low density residential to R15 medium density residential based on the following. The petition is found to be consistent with the City of Hendersonville 2030 comprehensive plan based on the information from the staff analysis and the public hearing and because the high intensity neighborhood and medium intensity neighborhood designations call for single family residential as a primary land use and the proposed zoning district permits single family and two family residential uses. We find this petition to be reasonable and in the public interest based on the information from the staff analysis and the public hearing and because the proposed zoning district is compatible with the surrounding area because it permits the same land uses as the existing zoning district. The petition provides for a marginal increase in density and close proximity to a wide range of commercial uses. The petition would potentially provide additional housing that would utilize existing infrastructure and the petition creates the opportunity for compatible infill development. Thank you. Is there any discussion? Not. Those in favor of the Signal Hill rezoning say aye. 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 Those opposed say no. Ayes have it. And uh, that has been done. Thank you. That was a lot of parcel numbers. 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Had to pull a lot together for that. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay, another standard rezoning. This is at 806 Shepherd Street. Yes, ma'am. Uh, as you mentioned, this is a standard rezoning uh, at, for 806 Shepherd Street, which is at the corner of Old Spartanburg Road. Uh, applicant is David Mayo. They are requesting to go from a residential single family R15 to C3, which is highway business. It is uh, just over a half an acre uh, lot. Uh, you can see the uh, there's a, kind of a split, two dominant zoning districts in the area, the C3 highway business. Uh, mainly over along and along Spartanburg Highway and the R15 medium density residential. Uh, the C3 zoning abuts the western property line of the subject property and is also found directly across Shepherd Street um, uh, to the south. Uh, and some of the parcels to the northeast are zoned R15 medium density residential, and with the abundance of the R15 district being located to the east, northeast on the opposite side of Old Spartanburg Road in the ETJ. Parcel situated between Old Spartanburg Road, uh, which is a minor thoroughfare, minor thoroughfare, and Spartanburg Highway, which is a major thoroughfare, contain a mix of commercial and residential uses with some single family uses located in the C3 zoning district. So taking a look at the comparison between these two zoning districts, there are some uh, uses that are in, that are permitted in both zoning districts. And those are shown in green, and there's some variations between those where there's some similarities, but some, some minor differences. The significant difference comes with the uh, very long list of commercial uses that are permitted in the C3 that are not permitted in R15. So this is where your significant change is. There are some variations in lot size as well uh, between the two zoning districts. Uh, just taking a look at the subject property, um, upper left is from Old Spartanburg Road, looking at the, the structure that is currently on the site. The upper right is um, looking um, from uh, Shepherd Street uh, back towards um, Old Spartanburg. On the bottom left, you're looking at the rear of the structure on the site, looking back up towards Old Spartanburg Road. And on the bottom right, you're looking across uh, from Old Spartanburg across towards Shepherd Street, and you can see the new uh, Mountain Express car wash that was under construction at the time of the photo. Taking a look at the future land use map, you see a pretty um, stark uh, line that runs along Old Spartanburg. So the future land use designation for this parcel is Neighborhood Activity Center. Um, and that is the designation for the properties that are running along either side of Spartanburg Highway and uh, all between Spartanburg Highway and Old Spartanburg Road. High intensity neighborhood is a de designation for parcels located to the east of Old Spartanburg Road. Spartanburg Highway, as I mentioned, is, a, is designated or classified as a major thoroughfare, while Old Spartanburg Road and Shepherd Street are both designated as minor thoroughfares. So looking at the comprehensive plan consistency, in this case, the C3 zoning district is consistent with the neighborhood activity center lo um, locations and uses. There is uh, there is not certainty that it will conform with the development guidelines and considerations for um, uh, the activity node, since C3 does not have any design standards, there's no assurances um, that it would hit, that it would meet those development guidelines. Uh, should be noted that multifamily is a recommended land use in the uh, neighborhood activity center, but it is not a permitted use in the C3. Um, the petition is consistent with the growth management designation of priority infill area. Um, these are areas that are considered for uh, high priority for the city to encourage infill development. Um, the land use chapter obviously goes into detail about encouraging infill development, as does the population and housing chapter. Uh, the population and housing chapter also states to maintain and enhance older neighborhoods so that they retain their value and viability in the face of demographic and market changes. Um, and the natural and environmental uh, resources chapter had no goals uh, or strategies, nor did the cultural and historic resources, community facilities, nor the water resources chapters. Transportation and circulation just had um, a minor note that uh, to encourage mixed-use pedestrian-friendly development that reduces the need to drive between land uses. The next criteria for compatibility, in this case, there's a mix of C3 and R15 zoning in the area. 
and the subject property is located at the intersection of two thoroughfares. Uh, the change conditions, uh, the commercial redevelopment is occurring in vicinity of this parcel. The fourth uh, criteria for public interest is the C3 uh, would permit a range of additional commercial uses. Uh, considering public facilities, the site is served by city water and sewer. It is served by two NCDOT uh, maintained streets and effect on natural environment. The parcel already contains uh, an existing structure. There's a blue line stream on the property, uh, but it, however, it is piped. There's a hundred year floodplain located across the street, um, south of Shepherd Street. And looking at the NC, uh, the North Carolina uh, Biodiversity and Wildlife Habitat Assessment data showed that it was unrated since this was already developed. Planning Board considered this and recommended approval unanimously um, at their meeting in January and they uh, recommended it based on this comprehensive plan consistency statement shown as well as the rationale for, for approval that are shown on the screen and with that um, I will open it up for any questions. Questions? All right. Thank you. Thank you. The Madam Attorney, has this public hearing been advertised in accordance with general statutes? Yes, Mayor, it has. Thank you. So we will open this public hearing. Is there anyone who wishes to speak uh, for this standard rezoning on Shepherd Street? Anyone present? Is there anyone online? Madam Mayor, we have one hand raised. Okay. You would call on that person, please. Lynn, you are unmuted. Hi, thanks. Uh, Lynn Williams, Chadwick Avenue. Um, this is more a plea to the developer as well. If they're listening, there are three beautiful trees along the front of that site that I've always loved. If in the development process they can save those trees, that would be greatly appreciated. That's my main concern for this property. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else? not we'll close that public hearing council discussion or a motion i'll take this one okay. <clears throat> madam mayor i'm a city council adopt an ordinance amending the official zoning map of the city of hendersonville changing the zoning designation of the subject property pin 9578-41-9518 from r15 medium density residential to c3 highway business based on the following one Petition is found to be consistent with the City of Hendersonville's 2030 Comprehensive Plan based on information from the staff analysis and the public hearing and because the Neighborhood Activity Center designation calls for neighborhood retail sales as a, and services as a primary recommended land use and office multifamily and other similar uses as secondary recommended land uses at the location of the subject property. And then two, we find this petition to be reasonable and in the public interest based on information from the staff analysis and the public hearing and because the petition allows for increased intensity of uses at the intersection of two minor thoroughfares the petition would align with the parcels proximate to the subject property which are zoned c3 and located between old spartanburg road and spartanburg highway the petition creates the opportunity for infill development at a greater density and or in, uh, intensity and the petition promotes walkable neighborhoods by creating mixed land use patterns that place residents within walking distance of services. Okay. Thank you. Is there any discussion? Not those in favor of the standard rezoning on Shepherd Street say aye. 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 Those opposed say no. Ayes have it. That one's taken care of too. Thank you. And then we have a uh, conditional zoning district, Lakewood Apartments. Here he comes back again. <laughs> All right. Okay. Third and final uh, presentation for the evening. Um, this uh, project is uh, a CZD rezoning, as you mentioned, um, for the uh, first victory apartments on Lakewood Road. The uh, zoning uh, currently on this 
60 and a half acre parcel is I-1. Uh, the applicant's proposing, applicant uh, again is Travis Fowler's first victory. Uh, it's proposing urban residential uh, in order to do a multifamily development consisting of 322 residential units. And, uh, and another use would be uh, daycare is also associated with this. Take a look at the site, uh, upper left picture, you have the bend uh, where Francis Road uh, curves and, uh, and becomes Lakewood Road. This is right at the entrance to the site. And the upper right is kind of a, a good typical view when you just enter off of uh, Lakewood, what the site looks like in the center. Um, there's a number of Bradford repairs and um, uh, you can see kind of some, some damage from uh, uh, the, the site being occupied with camps. On the bottom left, you see a tributary uh, creek that, that kind of bisects the property. Um, and there is a, a stream bank restoration uh, that the city has done and a sewer line running along that corridor. And on the bottom right is where that tributary uh, connects with the Allen Branch. And you can see the associated floodplain of Allen Branch and the Clear Creek uh, floodplain off in the distance to the right. That floodplain off in the distance is also part of the 60 and a half acres. Um, you can see looking across, standing across Allen Branch, looking back at the property, you see the tree line uh, that's growing along the creek. Um, you can see uh, on, the, um, on the western side where it is bound or bordered by I-26. Um, lots of uh, truck traffic there. Uh, upper right picture is a more of a typical view. As you get further from Lakewood, the top of a knoll is a, is a, uh, a stand of more mature hardwood trees. And then as you get to the edge of the knoll, um, it drops off and uh, it's pretty steep on that northern side and it overlooks that floodplain that I mentioned earlier, the Clear, Clear Creek Greenway floodplain. Um, uh, so you look down over that, and that is the location where the uh, Clear Creek Greenway uh, is going to be located. And I mentioned earlier, Allen Branch running along the site, which we'll see in the site photo. There's also a Greenway uh, Spur Trail, which I have some information on uh, there. So looking at the site plan, it depicts eight apartment buildings uh, just under 50 feet tall, containing 322 residential units. There is a clubhouse, a pool, and a playground, and a dog park proposed, um, kind of located in this vicinity. And then there's also a daycare that's proposed on a separate parcel, and that's located here. Um, the uh, plan illustrates the driveways, the sidewalks, uh, the roundabout at the intersection of Francis Road and Lakewood, um, 535 proposed parking spaces, 87% um, of the site is proposed to remain open space. Uh, and I'll just note that there was consideration given to fire access at this point where the kind of the first cluster of buildings is then, you know, connecting over to the back uh, buildings. This is that tributary I mentioned. And so um, they've proposed to have an extra wide driveway there to accommodate um, fire access. Um, and that took some discussion uh, and a fire marshal's discretion on uh, Appendix D, the use of Appendix D in that case. Um, this site plan was reviewed by the DRC, Development Review Committee. Uh, the details of that were, and the comments were in the staff report. I'll go over a few of the items and the list of conditions. Uh, the Community Development Department comments were all resolved or addressed by conditions. Uh, Planning staff proposed uh, the roundabout, uh, and that was agreed upon. I mentioned the fire marshal and the fire access. Um, there's the city engineer, um, there's a note that still needs, will need to be re resolved at final site plan regarding sewer access. Um, floodplain administrator, water sewer department, stormwater administrator, public works director, Henderson County Soil and Erosion Control, all had comments that, will, uh, that were resolved or will be resolved at final site plan. And I just want to note that um, um, through, as this project has, has moved forward and at the time of planning board, there was a condition that had been discussed that came from staff related to um, utilizing, um, allowing for public access through the development, uh, utilizing a, uh, these trails 
that have been proposed to connect to the, the city's greenway and a request was made that that would be publicly accessible and that there would be 14 parking spaces reserved for a trailhead. Uh, it was ultimately between planning board and now the Clear Creek Greenway uh, uh, project has kicked off and the, the studying the feasibility and um, the consultants that are working on that have looked at this and uh, it was deemed that that would not be feasible. The connection would not be able to meet ADA and um, wouldn't be able to be used as a public access. And so, so we, are, we have since dropped that um, proposal. Um, and I just, the, the city's transportation consultant who is here this evening, Jonathan Guy, and NCDO sta NCDOT staff also reviewed the TIA um, and reviewed the site plan um, and there's some additional information and conditions on the TIA. Going into the conditions, uh, so we have these four conditions that, um, that exceed standards uh, where the developer is offered to provide uh, land uh, in the floodway, the Clear Creek floodway to either the city or nonprofit organization. Uh, they uh, propose to provide an easement for both of the greenways I've mentioned and to replant or plant uh, reforest the uh, that big open pasture floodplain area which was seen in the photographs uh, with 140 additional trees they've also requested um, to reduce some standards in a few spots the first one is really a technicality um, related to the the language that's in our urban residential uh, zoning district related to which future land use designations uh, are permitted the second one um, is related to the fire access that I mentioned um, where the fire marshal has reviewed that and approved that and the third is um, the uh, is really not a necessary condition the there's a suggested maximum of one space per unit in the urban residential district this is just essentially outlining that they're going to exceed that um, the developers, the tree board initiated some conditions as well. The developers agreed um, to uh, the request of the tree board and that's what these four conditions outline. And then the planning board added um, a couple of conditions um, that uh, were uh, considered at length during their meeting. The first was related to the TIA and ensuring that a complete TIA, satisfactory TIA um, be completed and that the developer be responsible for any required mitigation as a result um, from that TIA. And the second was that, um, that the, the developer provide 10 affordable housing units and um, they kind of kicked it to staff to, to work on what the, the details of that would look like. And so we've got a little more detail uh, related to both of those. The first three conditions that are shown on the screen now um, relate to the TIA. And so the first is that they, um, they provide a TIA that's deemed acceptable by the city and NCDOT. Since this was um, put in, uh, in place in your packet in the staff report, NCDOT has, um, has provided a, an approval of the TIA and some details related to that. Um, the second uh, relates to uh, recommendations from the city's transportation consultant at the access point for the daycare that's proposed. And then the third relates to improvements along US 64 uh, where it intersects with Francis Road and Sugarloaf Road. There is uh, mitigation already uh, required by the Universal Lakewood development, which is uh, adjacent to this, uh, this project. Um, and so working that out in conjunction with uh, NCDOT and in conjunction with that other development and the mitigation they're required, the improvements they're required to make uh, is, is kind of wrapped up into that condition. And then the fourth is uh, what staff kind of briefly put together uh, for the affordable housing language, uh, which would be that uh, 10 units would be made available and dispersed throughout the development, made available to residents at 60% AMI or less, and uh, at least for the, the first initial 10 years uh, that the project's in place, and that they provide an annual report to the city. The developer, uh, in response to that, provided a uh, more detailed 
uh, outline of what they would agree to in terms of the um, provision of affordable housing units and uh, that language is making everybody's eyes blurry on the screen uh, right now. Um, I am not going to read it um, unless y'all want me to. I don't know if you've seen it or had a chance to chew on it. Staff is generally okay with the languages presented with an exception that um, the developer be responsible for providing a report that it not be on staff to say, hey, your report's due, uh, annual report, that they, that they consistently provide that report in a timely manner. And so I'll, I can bring this back up if there's questions. Uh, next slide is on the neighborhood compatibility meeting. This was back in June uh, 2022. Uh, lightly attended. Uh, there were uh, questions around traffic impact, um, the rates for rental, uh, um, the compatibility related to the height and how the site would be managed, uh, lighting, environmental impacts, things of that nature. Taking a look at the current land use, it is uh, currently zoned I-1, as mentioned, is bordered by I-26. Um, we've, we've, we've covered the access. Uh, it is bordered to the north uh, by Universal Lakewood, which is a PRD. It's currently under construction, 291 units on 27 acres. Um, a large portion of the subject property contains a floodplain. Approximately 30 acres of it are in floodplain and floodway. Uh, the largest portion of the floodplain is found in the in the portion of the property to the northwest. This portion of the property borders Clear Creek, and parcels abutting Clear Creek to the northwest are zoned C3 Highway Business. And to the southeast, parcels along Francis Road are zoned PRD, feature multifamily uses as well as um, some C2 zoning uh, and non-residential uses and some low-density residential uses. So quite a mix. Taking a look at the future land use map. Um, the portion of the site proposed for the multifamily structures is designated as business center due to its proximity to I-26. Um, the portions of the parcel located in the floodplain are designated as natural resource and agriculture. Portions of the subject property where apartment amenities and daycare are proposed, along with other parcels along Francis Road, are designated as regional activity center. So looking at our first criteria for uh, comprehensive plan consistency. The project is consistent with the goals, recommended land uses, and development guidelines of the business center uh, future land use designation. The site uh, is designated as priority growth area in the growth management map and is also identified as a development opportunity. Compatible infill, de in infill development as well as the provision of a mix of land uses is also supported by the population and housing chapter. Uh, additional strategies incur are encourage variation in lot sizes and housing types within new developments. Encourage mixed land use patterns that place residents within walking distance of services. Uh, taking a look at the natural and environmental resources chapter, there are a number um, related uh, to this uh, proposal. Discourage and reduce development of structures and impervious services within the flood floodway and floodplain protect land adjacent to streams, to protect water quality, and protect wildlife habitat, encourage restoration of natural habitat and drainage patterns, uh, continually assess development and preservation efforts within areas planned as natural resource agriculture, encourage cluster development that preserves open space while allowing a return on investment, acquire or encourage, uh, acquire or encourage acquisition of environmentally sensitive properties, promote preservation of woodlands, promote the location and design of open space, um, and enable and encourage low impact development practices in stormwater. There were no goals and strategies uh, related to the cultural and historic resources chapter nor the community facilities chapter. The water resources chapter um, um, echoes the encouragement of low impact development practices and the prevention of development in the floodplains. Transportation and circulation chapter uh, promotes uh, the development of multimodal transportation systems that encourage pedestrian and bicycle usage. 
in order to promote pedestrian safety, reduce vehicle miles traveled, and encourage community interaction. Uh, it goes on to encourage mixed use, pedestrian friendly development that reduces the need to drive between land uses, identify and prioritize needed pedestrian connections within the community, encourage pedestrian connections between dead end streets and adjacent neighborhoods, and preserve and expand the public greenway system as a core component of the bicycle and pedestrian transportation system. Taking a look at the next criteria, compatibility. In this case, there's a large undeveloped track bordered by floodplain and I-26 adjacent to regional shopping, shopping uh, adjacent to other multifamily apartments and single family homes and manufacturing buildings, as well as in proximity to interstate oriented commercial uses. Third criteria is change conditions. Uh, the most significant change is the 291 apartments uh, associated with Universal at Lakewood development. Um, there's also the approval of the 99 units for cottages at Mastermind, um, which the annexation was on the agenda earlier this evening. Um, other changes include the widening of I-26 and the proposed construction of the Clear Creek Greenway. Um, the fourth criteria is public interest. Uh, in addition to the housing numbers that are provided on the screen, just I will note that 711 of the 1,614 approved multifamily <coughs> units are currently under construction. Fifth criteria is public facilities. The property will be served by city water and sewer, police, fire, and public works. Francis Road and Lakewood Road are local streets that are maintained by NCDOT. And uh, lastly, the sixth criteria, the effect on natural environment. Of the 911 trees on the site, 383 are proposed to be cleared and removed, it's 42%. The developer has proposed to plant 244 trees as part of their landscaping plan and an additional 140 trees to be planted uh, in an effort to reforest the pasture in the floodplain. Allen Branch Creek runs along the northern, northeastern edge of the property and a tributary bisects the property. The Allen Branch confluence with Clear Creek is located at the far northwestern point of the project. During the site visit, staff observed deer, frogs, monarch butterflies, and a variety of birds, including multiple birds of prey. The Planning Board recommended approval with conditions. I covered those conditions earlier. Um, it was unanimous approval with the comprehensive plan consistency statement shown on the screen and the four points of uh, rationale for approval shown on the screen. We also have a draft statement of denial, should you need it. And with that, I will open it up for any questions. Questions? Can you bring back up the slide with all the words on it? <laughs> I know exactly which slide you're talking. I know. <laughs> That's it. Mm -hmm. So it looks like it's, it's still 10 units for 10 years, but five of them are 60% AMI and five of them are 80% AMI. Am I? That's correct. Okay. And then there's some language about should someone, so should, should a tenant's income exceed that threshold, how would that be handled? Mm -hmm. And it looks like they'll get the remainder of their lease plus a one-year renewal. The other kind of item that stuck out to me is uh, the second sentence in the second to last paragraph, interior finishes and gross floor area may be reduced in quality and size to assist in lowering the cost of the development of the affordable units. Okay, thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you. Madam Attorney, has this public hearing been advertised in accordance with general statutes? Yes, Mayor. It has. Open this public hearing. Is there anyone present here who wishes to comment? Good morning, Mayor, Council Members, Brian Golden. I'm the attorney. I represent Travis Fowler and First Victory in this application. Um, because we just saw the slide with all the, the words on it, that was something that I, uh, with assistance of my client, developed after we considered the planning board's recommendation. 
So during the planning board meeting, we talked about the study that was commissioned by the Dogwood Health Trust about the missing uh, housing supply here in Henderson County. And the focus was completely on 80% AMI. I think there was a little bit of talk about a missing section for 120 of the area median, medium income. And so their, their specific condition was just to work with city staff to provide 10 affordable housing units. When you start diving into that, you not only want protection for the developer to make sure that he's going to do or she's going to do what's required, but also for the city so that you all know we are committed to that um, <coughs> condition. And a lot of the communities around this area have started this inclusionary housing zoning district, which appears to me to be like an overlay district that they have that talks about 80 and 60% AMI. So I took some specific language out of surrounding communities that are similar to Hendersonville to kind of draft that language with all of the words in it. And the reason that we, that we said, yeah, we'll do 10 years, 10 units, five at 80 and, and five at 60 was because we just, we don't have any experience of who's gonna come in and apply. And we don't wanna leave any units empty. And so we thought if we had that range that we would definitely fill 60, we could certainly fill that 80, um, but, but you know, it, it, was, it was kind of a compromise saying, all right, let's look at that and see what we can do. The, and Travis will talk about the finishes again, we're happy to strike the finished portion of it taken out because we don't think we're going to be able to dedicate 10 units forever that will, you know, like, like this unit is going to be the unit we're going to uh, do affordable housing. They're going to be spread throughout the, the entirety of the development. And when, and then the year, the provision of living out or, you know, staying in the remaining year term, by law we have to, we couldn't have victim. Uh, because they exceeded that 80 or 60 percent goal and then allowing them one more year to extend it with still giving the developer <coughs> credit for the affordable housing was because at at the end of the the lease term you'd hate to say sorry you make too much money you have to go somewhere else so we wanted to give the benefit to the individual who has now succeeded who has overcome that 80 or that 60% AMI and not say, well, now that you've done it, you gotta find another place to go. And so we think that was a fair, again, compromise to allow the individual who has success to remain in their home for an extended period of time. And it may be that another unit opens up uh, and then we can lease that one uh, under the 80 or the 60%. And finally, we had, we had put the burden on the city to request from us um, documentation of compliance. And the reason I did that is because I didn't know who at the city we would give that information to. And so I thought, well, if they request it from us, we'll at least know who to give it to. And so I guess it would be something that we would ask for is to tell us who we would provide that information to because we'll develop a criteria threshold when that's satisfied. If we know who to give it to, we can hand it to them. And so I, I, think, it's a, I think it's a great first start. We, we really tried with, with the help of the developers team to work with the city to get those affordable housing units. And I think Travis, I'm gonna let him talk um, about it, but I think it's a, it's a great project and it's, uh, I think that's gonna work out wonderful for the community. Any questions for Mr. Golden? Thank you. Oh, yeah, sorry, I apologize. I was ready to walk away. Before okay. I judge you too harshly, are you the one that wrote the words in there about the furnishings? Was yes. you or Travis? No, that was me. Mm. Usually you guys have better ways with words than those. So that, that, would, that, came straight, <laughs> <laughs> that came straight out of the inclusionary zoning of, I believe it was like Charlotte or one of the small communities around there. That's almost verbatim of what it said, and I suspect it's because in those inclusionary zonings, they allow them to dedicate a particular unit. And so yeah, that was my language that I took directly out of that. When I sent it to Travis, he'll tell you what his answer was is, we can't do that, Brian, because we're not gonna, there's not gonna be a specific 
10 units dedicated. It may, be, it may change throughout the entirety of the development. And so we would be absolutely acceptable to striking that provision out of that, um, out of that language that I proposed. Again, just a proposed condition that protects both the city in the sense of commitment from Travis and protects us so that we know what, what, we're, what we have to do. Thank you, and I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm Travis Fowler with First Victory. We're the applicant. Thank you for hearing our CZD application. A lot of information to cover tonight. And so number one, I'd like to just kind of simplify a lot of the topics that are going to come up. Number one, um, we, we've responded to the request from the planning department to draft an affordable unit stipulation, which you've heard from Brian. We, um, we added language to that stipulation to help clarify potentially uh, other petitions that would be made in the future. We were concerned about who would administer that and uh, that, that was part of the, the language that we wrote in our stipulation. Um, maybe some developer thinks that they can stipulate the finishes uh, amongst a larger development, and uh, maybe they can do that, but our property management people have said to me, hey, uh, that unit could potentially stay empty because its finishes are not the same as the rest of the finishes. We would recommend that you don't do that. So. Maybe some developer uh, that we borrowed that language from thought that was a good idea. We don't think it's a good idea. And there's other reasons I don't think it's a good idea as well. I think everyone's going to enjoy the nice view that they have in this development. And I think everyone's going to enjoy the very nice finishes that they have. And they're going to be the same for everyone. Um, so I, th I think that's just the answer to that simply. Um, we also prepared um, a... Uh, we're prepared to agree to the stipulation related to NCDOT uh, uh, providing a driveway permit for our site. There is some confusion on my part, um, and staff has helped me many, many more times than they should have uh, related to this issue. But in my understanding, the stipulation that we need to agree to is that NCDOT will tell us what traffic improvements are required for the area and as part of our CZD approval we would agree to a stipulation that stated that whatever those uh, uh, requirements are as part of the driveway permit we would agree to. Um, there's a lot of potential questions about the TIA that we performed, Teague and Associates did for us, David Hyder is here to answer questions uh, should they, they come up. But I would just like to simply say that NCDOT will regulate that driveway permit and they will determine for us what is required. Um, they know what projects they have on the books that they're going to approve in the future. They know what other projects are coming in the area and whether other TIAs have been performed. They know what those scopes look like. And so I'm not exactly sure that it's the right time for us to agree to the language of a TIA because actually, in my understanding, uh, NCDOT will approve our driveway permit and they will require us as part of that permit to do uh, improvements. And so I would just like to state that whatever those improvements are, as long as we are able to uh, receive the easements that may be necessary uh, for those improvements, then we, are, uh, we agree to a stipulation moving forward with that. Um, so um, the tree board made several recommendations to us. We've agreed to those. There was some discussion in the planning board about dark sky. Uh, we have a new solar light that we're using in other apartment complexes. They have a remote control. You can change the direction of the light, the intensity of the light, the nature of the light, the color of the light and we're gonna utilize that same product on this property. I think we are uh, gonna be dark sky compliant, which was the request of one of the planning board members. Um, we, well, and we're gonna to agree to the stipulations that Matthew has stated. Um, and to me, the important uh, conversation here is that 
this property is adjacent to a large piece of pasture land that was at some point large trees, most likely. So I grew up in the country. We used to clear areas. In fact, when trees would grow up uh, adjacent to a pasture, we would go cut down the black walnuts. We'd go cut down the, uh, the, the trees living along the stream bank to give more sunlight to our pasture, to allow more grass to grow, to give more space for a horse to eat. That's not the case on this property anymore. What is the case is that the property we're proposing to develop is adjacent to I-26. There are trees on that property. Most are tertiary growth at best, and most, I shouldn't say most, uh, a large number of them are species of trees which the tree board has asked us to remove, the Bradford pears, which we've agreed to do. What I'd also like to do is I'd like to go across the stream in that floodplain area, and I'd like to reforest that area. I'm a um, environmental science degree. I think that that's very important. We can provide shade to Clear Creek. Um, the majority of the aquatic life living in Clear Creek would prefer cool water, not warm water. The same with Allen Branch, and I think that's what we're proposing to do, what we're attempting to do in that area. The, the next point that's really become very important to me is um, the access that the people in this development would have right next to their, where they live, right down a trail, is going to be a large green space. Most apartment complexes don't find themselves adjacent to those type of green spaces. I read an article a couple of weeks ago, I, I think I talked to Mrs. Hensley about that. Um, the, the article found that uh, out of 25 young individuals that were found to be on medication to help them maintain their mental health, they found a reduction in the amount of medication necessary by 50%. In 25, well, they studied 25 people and they found it to be true in all 25 people. My point is, let's consider that we could put 322 apartments adjacent to a very large green space that we're going to um, give to a nonprofit or we're going to give to the city. Um, let's also consider that the greenway is going to pass through this property and we're uh, ready to help the city facilitate that greenway through our space. Let's also consider that Mastermind right up the road will have connection to that green space. Let's also consider that Universal doesn't currently legally have access to that pasture land. They may be able to walk on it in much the same way as the encampments are on the property that we have now, but that's not legal access. That's private property. We're going to make that public property. We're going to reforest that area. We're going to allow the people to walk along Clear Creek. In my career, 30 years and several, a lot of development, um, I haven't found many opportunities where I could have uh, an apartment complex where I feel like we're meeting those type of, uh, of uh, I idealism that we, we all talk about so much. Um, we're going to displace some butterflies. We're going to displace some squirrels. That's going to happen. That's true. That's part of development. But if we allow density in this area closer to town and the highest density that we can we could do. I know most people are frightened by the high density terminology, but it's not going to head out. Um, it's not going to head out 64 into Edneyville and to some of the areas. The simple term for that is sprawl, and so I think that we can help eliminate that 322 units at a time, at least here, at least one time. Um, I didn't really realize that we were we were going to have 87% open space with our development until Matthew stated that. Thanks, Matthew. I should have remembered that. But um, that, is, uh, that is all that I have to present to you. If you have questions, I'm happy to answer. I do have Brian here who loves to talk. And, uh, and John Kennard, our consulting civil engineer, is here as well. And David Hyder is here to answer questions about traffic impact analysis. If you have any questions, I'm happy to field those for you. Any questions for Mr. Fowler? Yeah. 
Yeah. Like you covered it all. All right, thank, thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who wishes to speak on this development? Oh, I'm sorry. Or the Limit. zoning district? Hmm? Anyone else who wishes to speak? Is there anyone online who wishes to speak? Madam Mayor, we have two hands raised. And again, if you're online, if you will give your name and address for the clerk's record, please. Lynn, you are unmuted. Thank you. Um, my concerns here are for the ridgetop forest ecosystem that is so valuable for our community. The habitat, the birds, the monarchs, the animals, um, all that live on top of the ridge are very different than the animals that will be living in the proposed redeveloped pasture. Once we, uh, the staff recorded seeing monarchs, I heard the developer just say, oh, you know, displace some butterflies. I believe we have a monarch pledge and we see how valuable the monarchs are as an endangered species. I think this is really important because right now it looks like out of 911 trees, 383 will be clear cut, which is 42%, leaning more towards 50% than the tree board's 30% plea. Bird migration passes directly through this area, and it's proven that migrating birds need patches of forest on ridge tops in order to live. I'm also concerned about the stream buffer. Originally during the planning board, they did talk about potential encroachment on the stream buffer, which may include some of the city's already invested stream rehabilitation. So I just wanted to encourage that we not encroach in any of the stream. Um, <clears throat> uh, I did hear that there will be potentially affordable housing, but I'm counting about 3% affordable housing in order to cut down almost half of this forest. The wording in the statement definitely implies discrimination. Will the units that are affordable be closer to the interstate? where the buffer that is currently there will be removed and there'll be no air, air filter protection. I'm also concerned about the bottleneck where the entryway in and out and the concern to public safety, this two separate entry design is funneling in and out of the same point of access. And there's a concern that there could be flooding due to the waterway right below. Um, number three for denial was listed as the intensity of proposed development does not align with the environmentally sensitive area in and around the subject property, which includes grading and partial removal of forests along blue line stream areas, something along those lines. I really feel concerned about the amount of clear cutting that's going to happen and what that means for our environment for our climate, for our animal habitat. And once again, I urge you to consider to save more canopy. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Williams. Thank you. Any others? Madam Mayor, we have one more. Uh, Ken Fitch, you are unmuted. Ken Fitch, 1046 Adams Street. Tonight we have before us an elaborate proposal on maps, charts, and site plans for an eight-building apartment complex in a prime location adjacent to I-26, just down the road from 64, and close to Walmart and Sam's Club, and, and with a hiking trail connection to the Greenway. As we scroll through the plans, we see a flow of green and blue, <coughs> and red and green dots sparking out of this. However, after last month's city council meeting and Mr. Shanahan's presentation with a different set of maps, we might be spurred to see things from a different perspective. Indeed, should we venture to the world, view the world 
from a ground level perspective, the current experience of the site here is distinctive. <clears throat> the area includes a prominent canopy tree forest and an open plain known to flood. When city staff embarked on a casual visit, as recorded in the photos in the packet, they experienced the forest of canopy trees that increased in integrity as they progressed through the site, where midway they encountered the tributary stream that is part of the larger stream network. They saw deer, moderate butterflies, a variety of birds, including birds of prey, and frogs, an indicator species, as where there are frogs, there are aquatic, amphibian, and insect species, all of these elements of a functioning ecosystem. In the area adjacent to the proposed project, the city has embarked on a stream restoration program after a lengthy process of planning and loan and grant application, and their efforts have been rewarded with special recognition by the EPA and other entities for the important work. With the project under consideration, we have been presented face to face with renderings of the major multi-story buildings that would be placed at this adjacent location for which it would be necessary to alter the terrain and remove the core of the forest and significantly negotiate a crossing of the tributary stream that would separate the two sections of the development for which a connection is necessary. And this will be more than a hiking trail over a man meandering brook, as there will be a need to construct a major road to pass over the stream to convey the heavy equipment, to clear cut the center of the forest and grade the site and to construct the three major buildings. Also parking lots, the dark sky, compliant lighting and all the other utilities for this site functionality. <clears throat> and yes, the trail downhill to the greenway requires expertise for designing a feature that often entails erosion control issues and requires continuing maintenance. With this project, we find ourselves at cross purposes here, with challenges to our stated commitment to tree canopy protection, preservation of wildlife habitat, stream protection, and the mayor's monarch pledge. And as such, our credibility might be somewhat shaken as we proclaim our environmental values and commitments and seek to venture to apply for further environmental loans, grants, assistance. <clears throat> and it is inescapably here, on ground level in the neighboring area, the road. Many times in the past, council has heard from nearby residents about existing traffic hazards and conditions here on these narrow winding roads. <clears throat> but now this road infrastructure, which, which many consider inadequate, would invite over 2,400 additional vehicle trips on roads that are unable to contain the existing presence. And we've heard that the PIA is not talking about the conditions of the roads as they exist. They're concerned about intersections. And that is something about which you may discuss. But we recognize that the routes here also have a critical function for an essential public service locally and beyond. And that is the US Postal Service. The annex is a hub to and from which mail from the Greenville Center is brought in large semi-trucks and then transferred to multiple other vehicles for deliveries to and from the city, county, and Asheville and points north, for which negotiating the potential amassing traffic and even the roundabout 
may prove obstructive. And we add to this network a daycare facility with very precious travelers. While on the drawing board and online, the plans for the project from above may look innovative and, and wonderful indeed as they do. In their actualization, the impacts may be severe and irreversible and ultimately prove dysfunctional and unsustainable for the goals of all involved. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Fitch. Is there anyone else seeking recognition? No. Okay. Thank you. And uh, that being the case, we will close that public hearing. Council, discussion? Any further questions? Uh, I'll start. Hmm? Okay. Um, I'd like to commend the developer on, first of all, having a daycare center. That's uh, something that is uh, way under utilized, or I should say utilized, not the right term. Uh, it's, it's a need, a major need in our area. Um, and there are a number, a number of attempts in the development, I think, to meet environmental concerns, particularly in the floodplain, uh, and particularly with trying to replace trees that you would have to remove and keep trees that you don't have to cut in the first place. Um, and I think the developer has been, uh, it sounds to me at least, very uh, open to negotiating and working with all the parties involved um, in trying to meet those needs. But the problem with this development is it is just too dense. As I said in the previous zoning, that was my limit on, on population density. And uh, today, in preparation for today, the most recent statistics that I could find using the most recent census data that I could find online, not being a member of the U.S. Census Bureau, um, is that city of Asheville's population density is 2,149 people per square mile. The city of Hendersonville's current population density is 2,162 people per square mile. So we are currently as dense as Asheville. And a uh, development like this exceeds or would exceed the R15 density. And that level of density is not the level of density that I'm willing to support. Um, while it looks like a, a nice development, um, the amenities that the developers agreed to do not outweigh the fact that this significantly, at least for this area, increases our population density to a point that I think is not compatible with the lifestyle that we would like. Uh, as reflected in the many discussions about the transportation. Um, and I think that uh, it just has too many units. So that's why I'm not going to support the proposal. Anyone else? I feel like part of the reason that it's so dense is because they're not developing in the area that they're going to either donate to the city or to a conservation organization. I would be curious under the current zoning, I-1, could that area that they are going to put up for conservation be developed as it is zoned right now? Uh, yes. Okay. There, there are constraints with the floodway and the floodplain um, that could make it more complicated, mm -hmm. but yes. And then in portions of that, uh, yes, the portion that they are, are talking about donating, um, the floodway could potentially be developed, but it would be very constrained. Yeah. But I feel like that's a huge deal mm -hmm. that we could save that piece of property from ever being developed with this development and it wouldn't be as dense if they were putting their units into that space too. So I understand completely what Jerry's saying, but I think there's a little bit of a give and take here. I would say 
as a proponent for the mayor's monarch pledge that it would be nice the tree board recommended planting appropriate native vegetation perhaps some of that is pollinator friendly vegetation so we could give the monarchs still somewhere to go uh, you're already going to be planting stuff so you might as well pick something that the pollinators enjoy um, so I think there is a workaround for that um, I think the daycare center is like a wildly awesome idea um, I mean all in all aside from removing that one thing about the finishes <laughs> I feel like this is in a pretty good spot I would be curious because I do know that there was controversy around the TIA to hear from Jonathan and how he feels about the proposed conditions. Um, I know they're in here, but I just like to hear from him directly if anybody else would be interested. Yes, I do. Good evening, Jonathan Guy, Kimley Horn. Uh, happy to answer any questions you might have after I answer uh, Ms. Simpson's questions. Um, there's been a lot of discussion there's been a lot of review a lot of back and forth with ncdot relative to this uh, looking through the most recent information shared by ncdot uh, and those improvements include a left turn lane into the daycare at 100 feet um, design of the roundabout for the main access point uh, which does address some of the concerns that i had with sight distance and the curvature uh, and changing of the the nature of the road from lakewood and francis as it comes together uh, and then working with NCDOT and the developer of Universal uh, at Lakewood on the intersection of Francis and Sugarloaf for improvements there. Uh, that combination um, of working up there is really important because there's, there's things when you talk to DOT relative to the infrastructure that needs to be holistically done together. Um, and as I understand it, the developer has agreed to work with that other developer to make sure those improvements through NCDOT are done correctly so that one developer is not putting something in that has to be removed and it's done at the appropriate time and the infrastructure is coordinated so that it does work together. Um, all in all, I am comfortable with the recommendations that have been put forth relative to the infrastructure. Okay, thank you. Sure, any other questions? I'm concerned about the traffic pattern on Francis Road. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, coming off of 64. Um, um, I was a previous resident of Cedar Bluff Apartments um, and uh, the U.S. mail trucks um, and people race down that road and that's a round, uh, a winding road. Um, we call it Dead Man's Curve after you pass the Cedar Bluff entrance, parking entrance. Um, and I also um, had a family member two years ago died, hit that tree that's just just past that entrance way. And I, I'm, I'm just concerned. Um, I understand. A lot of impact there. I understand. A lot of people use that road for the cut through, to go to Walmart, places like that, the, the um, mail annex. Um, it's, it's just, it's, it's too much. It's really too much. I would say the, the one, one thing that I would offer is that the, the roundabout will help to control speeds in that area and address the concerns that you just enumerated relative to safety around that, yes. uh, which is, you know, uh, sorry for your loss. Um, but that will help address that. It will slow traffic down, um, which I do feel is important. I've been out there before um, mm -hmm. when we were doing the field walk for the Greenway. You could see a lot of traffic moving through there, and I, I understand cut through traffic coming in the back door because you don't want to deal with the intersection of the 64. There is a, there is a daycare there already. Mm -hmm. um, it's closer to 64 um, by Dalton Car Carpet World and Needful Things, the anti in, and uh, the antique shop, excuse me, um, but it, it's, it's too much. Mm. And recently, uh, probably about two months, it's been about two months, um, the Hendersonville PD, they have an officer sitting out there to monitor those, the, the traffic that's coming off of 64 or coming from the other direction. Okay. Anything else? I actually welcome a roundabout there. Mm -hmm. I think that that's going to do 
I mean, amazing things for just that thoroughfare in general. And I'm glad that it was recommended and I'm glad that it's agreed to be a condition for this project. Statistically, you'll find that roundabouts, especially on two lane roads, are what NCDOT is putting in to solve a lot of safety issues relative to sight distance, speeds, um, as well as reducing uh, crashes. Um, they do, while they at first uh, communities have to adjust to those, um, they are very beneficial uh, in providing alternative mobility and managing traffic in ways that a traffic signal or just a normal four way stop will not do. So. Where we can put those in, I think they're a great thing. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Did you have a question? Hmm? I thought you had a question. Uh, no, it was more of a general okay. question. Uh, okay. I'll, I'll get the answer to that at some other point. <laughs> right. Anything else? Any other comments? Or a motion? And I'd, it says in here if that we might disregard two, could could uh, staff lead us through what we need to do? Because I know there are some some items under two that uh, probably need to be amended. So the we items under two that. include the three. Well, there's four items. The fourth of which is the affordable housing language, which. Um, required a little bit of tweaking based on the discussion here as relates to what was submitted by the um, developer. And then the other three are related to the TIA. Uh, those are staff's language, that's what Jonathan was referencing. Um, and I am not 100% clear based on Travis's comments that they agree to those three. Um, but those are what we would recommend would be included, so. Mr. Fowler, have you read the conditions on the, that were set forth, the three conditions for the TIA and the traffic? Um, yes, I have. And you support those? those? Um, I believe that we do support. Is that not what you recommended earlier today? We do support those recommendations. Yeah, the right of way is our concern. Um, we don't want to, I don't want to uh, overpromise when uh, the acquisition of a right of way to install some of the uh, traffic mitigation pieces is ultimately unavailable. I guess that was originally part of my concern. Is the right of way addressed in the t in, within those first three then? I think that's over on Fra it. where Francis Road contacts 64. Yeah. Isn't that where we're concerned about? Um, whether the right of way there exists to be able to actually install the NCDOT recommendation? Uh, no, actually, it's the, at the daycare. Actually. At the daycare, okay. All right, so if that's, that's the location, then we're certainly uh, willing to do whatever is necessary to, to meet that uh, requirement there of the TIA. Okay. 100 foot, I think is what, you, yeah, certainly. Okay. okay. Can we agree officially to plant pollinator friendly? vegetation um, I don't know why in the world I would not do that I don't know why either but I feel like I in this instance we need you to say that you would agree to do it we would agree to do that and we'd also agree to uh, stipulate that no one spray roundup on them and kill them after we've installed them thank you <laughs> <laughs> okay and number four uh, I think the change was five, five units mm -hmm. for uh, 60% and below and five, 80% and below, is that? Correct, that's our drafted. And we agree to take out the part about mm. finishes. <laughs> and I would think uh, if there's a question about providing an annual report, I would imagine it would go through our development department. Okay, we just need someone to point us that. there. Madam Mayor, I move. Are we ready? Yeah, I was just going to say, do we have, Sorry. have we covered everything? I think so. I don't know, Angie, how you, if they need to read. We don't have the language that the affordable housing in your motion. That's mm -hmm. not the language. So I, I'm not sure how you want that handled, Angie, but that would be the only thing I would point out. 
We just have to modify it. Yeah, I think you could just <clears throat> so go ahead. And if, if, if we're doing something wrong, stop us. If I screw up, just tell me. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Madam Mayor, I move the City Council adopt an ordinance amending the official zoning map of the City of Hendersonville, changing the zoning designation of the subject property PINS 9579-39-2060-9579-38-2595-9579-29-0718 and 9579-19-2770 from I1 Industrial to UR CZD Urban Residential Conditional, Conditional Zoning District for the construction of 322 multifamily units based on the site plan and list of conditions submitted by and agreed to the applicant and presented at this meeting and subject to the following. Um, the development shall be consistent with the site plan, including the list of applications that, um, and the following permitted uses, which are residential dwellings, multifamily, and child care. Um, the permitted uses and the application conditions presented on the site plan shall be amended to include one, that the developer agrees to provide a TIA deemed accept acceptable by the city and the NCDOT. Two, the developer agrees to recommendations made by city transportation consultant for the daycare access at Lakewood Road. Three, developer agrees to provide mitigation at the intersection of 64 and Francis Road uh, and Sugarloaf as recommended by the city transportation consultant in cons consultation with NCDOT and in conjunction with the required mitigation associated with the Universal at Lakewood development. Four, make 10 rental units um, affordable housing, um, five of those units at or below 60% AMI, and five units at or below 80 AMI for 10 years that the buildings are in service. The developer shall provide an annual report to the city development office. The petition is found to be consistent with the city of Hendersonville 2030 comprehensive plan based on the information from the staff and because the petition aligns with the city's 2030 comprehensive plan goals for business center, regional activity center, and natural resource and agricultural area future land use designations. Specifically, the proposal is consistent with the secondary recommendation land use and development guidelines under LU-13. Furthermore, we find this petition to be reasonable and the best public interest based on the information from the staff analysis, public hearing, and because the proposed density and housing type are compatible with the surrounding area. The petition provides, um, proposes to provide additional housing to offset local rental demand. The petition provo proposes to connect to the city's greenway network. Um, the petition proposes off offset tree loss with net gain, and the petition provides child care on site. Okay, is uh, there any further discussion? Can I be a stick in the mud to add under number two, the pollinator friendly vegetation? I can't help myself. It wasn't okay. said. <laughs> Perfect. Perfect. We're going to add pollinator gardens. Okay. Any objection Thank you. to adding that? Okay. All right. Any further discussion? not those in favor of the conditional zoning district for lakewood apartments say aye aye, aye. mayor also says aye those opposed say no no the uh, vote is three to two the ayes have it and the uh, motion has been adopted okay all right thank you all This is not an easy decision, and uh, we appreciate everyone who commented and expressed their concerns. All right, uh, no unfinished business, so new business. Downtown Business In Investment Initiative. All right, good evening, uh, Madam Mayor and Council. Oh, there we go. Um, Thank you all for having us here tonight. It is uh, my pleasure to kick off a, a new program that we are starting with the downtown division here with the city. Um, and to give a little bit of background of how we got to this point, um, that's what I wanna go backwards a little bit to then introduce the program. So back in 2020, um, 
we all know what happened. <laughs> no secret. Um, but when the COVID shutdowns began, there were several areas of needs that rose to the top as far as uh, needs for businesses to maintain resiliency here in our community. Um, that's both for current businesses and reducing the barriers of entry for success for new businesses, um, especially from entrepreneurs who come from marginalized <laughs> communities. Some of those items that really rose to the top as needs included additional training and technical assistance, which through um, a lot of COVID initiatives with Blue Ridge Community College and different resources, there were a lot of accessibility for a lot of those things virtually. Um, access to capital, so the ability to receive and qualify for loans to um, open or grow <laughs> or um, improve their business and also to, pur to purchase commercial property. Um, and that leads it into phys physical space, um, startup space, incubator space, and even market space. Our farmer's market even had, serves as an example as a business incubator. Um, we're very proud that we have two brick and mortar businesses that have started as a result of our farmer's market. An additional need that we saw for physical space um, was the ability for businesses who are already located in our community to own their commercial property. <clears throat> and then the last kind of area that we found were needs for um, or ability to take local wealth and invest it into our local businesses. As we were talking about all of these things, it just so happened that uh, at the same time, or not long after, the Dogwood <laughs> Health Trust opened up a grant opportunity for um, what they called access to capital for underfueled entrepreneurs. Uh, the grant RFP included, um, or was about giving opportunities to CDFIs and other non-traditional lenders to support their ability to provide capital to underserved entrepreneurs. Um, they had a priority to build capacity to deploy capital and development services to what they're calling under, underfueled entrepreneurs in a lasting and enduring manner. Um, in addition to that, they were looking for um, ways to improve systems and transform systems for how um, folks receive these type of services. So, uh, you know, sat through a webinar about this grant. I'm like, well, this sounds interesting, but definitely not something that we can do on our own. Um, so we started working for identifying partners. Um, and that's where things really kind of fell together as part of this grant application. Um, we initially, I had an initial conversation with Ben Smith at the Small Business Center who had connected me with Bruce and our guests here today. Um, Bruce is with uh, Black Wall Street AVL and they were already interested in looking for more opportunities in Hendersonville and Henderson County. Um, the big part of this grant, which I'll go into a little bit more, is the, um, the small business loan and lending side of things, um, which we definitely would not know what we're doing here in-house, um, but we're very fortunate in Western North Carolina to have Mountain BizWorks, which is a CDFI, which means it's a community development financial institution. Um, and those type of institutions exist to provide um, access to credit or other services to support um, small businesses or families and communities for further economic stabilization. They've been around for 34 years and um, have been a great resource. And I've, I've learned a lot through different classes that they've taken. Um, so anyway, those partners really came together um, and really worked quite well as an overall grant um, application. So then we got it. <laughs> and so then we were like, <laughs> Okay, Yay. this is great, but now, now, the, now the hard part comes of, of putting all of these things together to start something that's really new for something that, that our, our city government has not done. Uh, so we received $400,000 for a two-year program where $360,000 of that goes into a loan program and $40,000 goes into training, technical assistance, and further uh, research and development for this program in order to make it a sustainable, lasting uh, benefit for our community. At the same time, we were doing our uh, 7th Avenue branding, and um, with the support of our folks with Arnett and Muldrow, um, they, they really kind of helped us come together with these um, 
styles and ways to really pay homage to, um, to old Brooklyn in the 7th Avenue district. So this kind of gets into phase one of this project, which is what the grant is really funding for. Uh, we're calling the program, I initially had Downtown Business Investment Initiative, but after a conversation yesterday with our partners, we had um, really kind of came to this consensus that Opportunity Fund is really a better um, way to, to describe what we're trying to do. Um, so this overall Downtown Business Opportunity Fund would include the Main Street and 7th Avenue districts, but we have that intentional call out for the Brooklyn Business Opportunity Fund to um, related to the 7th Avenue District, particularly from all of the um, conversations that we had and have had over and over again with folks in and around that district of um, stories, history, and a lot of information about the historic black-owned businesses that were once in Old Brooklyn. And a lot of those, I've been reading all of our communication staff's uh, posts all throughout uh, Black History Month, and it really kind of hones in that that was a really important area for that community. So the goal of that initiative in particular is to connect communities of color and historically underutilized businesses in addition to other um, current businesses or entrepreneurs who maybe need additional guidance, not only just with loan funds, but with um, training, technical assistance, mentorship, and networks. The idea of having a Brooklyn Business Opportunity Fund as a part of this overall downtown fund is that you know, maybe in the future we might have other areas of development that would be important. So back to those four main areas, and this is what we really built our application around with the Dogwood Health Trust. That first part is uh, connecting people to programs, and that's where um, our partners really come into play a lot. Um, Mountain Biz Works, Black Wall Street, and Blue Ridge Community College provide a lot of really great resources. And in particular, Blue Ridge Community College provides some, some amazing resources for small businesses that people don't always know about and um, people aren't always comfortable entering in spaces that they're not used to. And that's where the folks with um, the Black Wall Street really come into play as being a resource navigator to help connect new or growing businesses, particularly um, entrepreneurs, people of color. They have uh, really proven a record of success over the past several years um, in Asheville of, of growing and building um, a community of, of um, entrepreneurs and people of color in a, a family model um, that supports participants who grow and connect together and connect to those resources. So they have cohort family model where they, they join and they work together um, and support each other through those programs. And, all different areas. In addition to that, for our local businesses that are already in place, we had a little bit of a soft kickoff with um, Blue Ridge Community College with um, Gary Heisey to do the Small Business Success Plan, where we had five downtown businesses participate in that already in February. The next part is the loan program. And that's where I've been working quite a bit with uh, City Attorney uh, Beaker on figuring out how we can make this work and all of the legal um, ways that local government gets involved with investments. Um, so in this, um, the, the budget for the grant, it was $360,000 earmarked, uh, which would go into the leverage lending fund at Mountain BizWorks. So essentially that's $360,000 that the city invests and money that's given to us from the Dogwood Health Trust, so not taxpayer dollars, um, that goes into this leverage lending fund. And that $360,000 is earmarked to our downtown Main Street and 7th Avenue areas, and it is only invested for a five-year term to which we can decide what to do with it at that point. It earns an interest rate where that revenue from interest can go back into additional business support as we adapt and determine what those needs are. We have those funds earmarked particularly for um, low income with an 80% of the area medium, median income, as well as a special emphasis on entrepreneurs of color and women-owned businesses, all of those which fall under the historically underutilized business category. 
So this tool gives the city the ability to make the investment in, form of that, in the form of that lending capital um, that can also be leveraged against the many other loan products that Mountain BizWorks has. So our $360,000 will more than likely be leveraged to, to additional loan capital that's available. So our plan is initially um, to have it earmarked with a split between our Main Street and 7th Avenue district, but build in some opportunities to revise if that's needed. It's a five-year investment, and then at that point, we, as I mentioned, we can determine what to do. So the third part is physical space. Um, it just so happened that our staff is moving out of our nice new office and back over to City Hall, which is great too. Um, but that leaves a, um, a beautiful office space that we've got right across the street from the new parking garage. Um, what our plan is, is to lease the two individual offices that can be enclosed, uh, which will be at a market rate so we can generate revenue that can continue to go into this program or other needs that are for um, businesses or interested businesses um, within what's allowed and then use that cubicle space that's in the back part of our office as well as the conference room space as a shared space almost like a small start of a business incubator uh, for folks who go through any of the training mentorship loan program as a part of this program so you know, if people need to have a, a private meeting room space or a virtual meeting room space, we have it and we'd have the ability to offer that. In addition, we've got that cubicle space that would have access to a computer, printer, um, internet. So then looking forward to after the first couple of years of startup, um, in the longer term, if this is a program that can grow and build and um, potentially become a model uh, for other local governments. And that really was the, the selling point of what the Dogwood Health Trust really appreciated about this was um, the idea of a local government working with um, partners, uh, lending partners, community partners to really build a program that can um, reach folks in the community that may not know about the access for it. Um, so as we continue on, it's really going to be a, a learning process through these all, whole next couple of years of what the needs are and adapting for that and adapting training or connections as far as that. Um, the physical space, you know, if we can ever find a, a larger space that would be able to house um, additional businesses at a lower barrier to entry as far as lower rent space and type, by type of shared market space or something like that, if those needs are identified. And if there's a location in the 7th Avenue district, I think that would be great. Um, access to capital, if there continues to be a need um, and ability to grow this fund in order to have um, a larger fund that can then further support that need of um, local businesses being able to own their property. Because that, going back to, to COVID, that was something that really showed as a, a very important need for businesses to be able to to maintain and adapt if they decide you know they they do want to finish and move on then they still have that property as a way to generate wealth within our local community and then on the local wealth and investment um, this is the area that will probably need a little more research and a little more figuring things out um, but again taking some of those opportunities through angel investment and crowdfunding investment crowdfunding in order to um, keep our money here in town with the folks who would like to give it that way. So the next steps, what we've got coming up next, um, in the next couple of weeks we'll be finalizing our contracts um, with our partners that are part of this grant program and then um, having our small project team really continue to build the strategy for this with the a planned program kickoff and community meetings to bring in other partners in April. Um, we really want to use all of this process to, to identify the needs as we're going and adapt as we need to. Um, and then in the summer, further defining and offering training and technical assistance needs as they're identified. Um, and we're really excited to just get this rolling. It's It's been a while that we've been working on it and I'm just, I, I feel really strongly about it and really 
happy that we're able to, to come here today to be able to present this. Um, and with that, I would like to introduce our partners that we've got here. Um, I guess we'll start with uh, your Bruce. Well, come on up. Um, so Bruce actually lives here in town. In County, yeah. So. Hey, how y'all doing? I'm Bruce, uh, Executive Director for Black Wall Street, one of the founding board members. I'm glad to be a part of this awesome, just historical moment. Funny thing is, I have a business myself, and um, Ben reached out to me. Um, he was like, hey, you want some, some uh, space? I have a digital marketing agency, and I do community development for national organizations and local organizations. And um, he uh, just reached out to me, we connected, had a great com conversation, and then moving forward from this, we're just excited to be here and be a part, grow together, work together, and also work really well with the partners that we already have. We already do existing work um, in Asheville, and we already have several uh, BIPOC members, our Latinx population, um, and even some folks from uh, indigenous populations are interested in what we do, um, even African Americans. And so we just love to be a part and continue to grow, and thank y'all for having me up here in these few moments that I have, and thank you so much. Uh, Jamie, you've always been awesome. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. And then uh, with Mountain Biz Works. Hey there, I'm Christine Locker and also live here in Hendersonville. Um, <clears throat> I work with Mountain Biz Works. We, as Jamie said, we're a CDFI. We're um, proud to have launched several well-established places along Main Street and in Hendersonville. Um, we've been doing uh, local investment across the western 26 counties of North Carolina for the last 34 years. 33, maybe, 34 maybe, because we're in 2023 now. Um, and really would love to just, I, I um, like started the Mills River Farmers Market probably 15 years ago or something like that, just as a fun pet project. Started another farmers market at Sierra Nevada um, and have been long, long connected to the farmers and the small business, you know, the craft artisans, the folks who are really, um, I think, a, a part of an economic powerhouse here in Western North Carolina. And so just really want to give a shout out to Jamie for working amazingly hard. Um, this grant opportunity could have easily gone to the next community over. And so I'm really thrilled to be having it here in my own backyard. And Becca also with Mountain Biz Works. Thank you so much for having us tonight. And I also just want to commend Jamie for her passion for this project, it's so comprehensive, as you can see, of all the facets of it legally and you know, personally with all the partners. And I think the thing I'm most excited about, honestly, is just the vast resource network that we can show up for your local entrepreneurs and for the community we're all building together. And part of our work at Mount BizWorks is not just providing loan funds, but really making sure entrepreneurs have resources for long-term success. And so as we think about continuing local ownership or even upcoming entrepreneurs who want to acquire a business for their growth to continue local investment by people who live in the community, I think that this is just going to be a program that we're going to be able to celebrate for years to come because there are so many people engaged in it that really want this community to continue to grow and thrive. So thank you for the opportunity to be part of the Opportunity Fund. And um, as someone on the team as Mountain Biz Works, you know, Christina and I are both cheerleaders of this program and ready to be ambassadors in the community. So thank you. Thank you. And maybe we could get the, um, the child care folks. Maybe they have a great business incubator <laughs> opportunity. <laughs> child care that's going into the yeah. development. <laughs> um, so that, that's what we've got. Um, I just, I, do we have a resolution that we've got to make over tonight? So there is about if there's any questions or anything like that, I'm here and they're here. Yes, sir. I have a question about the last slide. The last thing says connect with lenders, but we're the lender, right? Yeah, I no. That's probably kind of worded okay, a little so funny. So Mountain BizWorks is the lender. So this would be connecting us and or the folks with Mountain BizWorks. So what we we don't want to be looking at individual loans. From our end, and that's where they come into play. We we don't want to be in the business of of determining who should get a loan or not. Not making the loan. Okay. If I could clarify a little bit, yeah, <clears throat> so 
we will lend the money to Mountain BizWorks, who will then turn around and lend it out. We will get the 360 back plus, with interest in five years. That then we can turn around and reuse for something else. Okay. Yep. So we don't determine who actually gets the loans. Well, we come up with guidelines, um, and we tell them who would who well, we would like to see the money go to. Not well, that leads to my next question, which is anybody can apply for this loan, correct? Yeah, so anyone can apply to a loan to Mountain BizWorks. However, we have funds that are earmarked specifically for our downtown districts to where it can, or you might be able to answer this a little bit better, to where it can um, be specified for that area. And I'll, sure. And I'm happy to, we could get into the weeds if, if that's helpful, but I think just in sweeping terms, folks can come in through the front door at Mountain BizWorks to get a loan. And folks that are um, a good fit with the priority populations for this particular lending fund, we would pull the money on the back end from this fund to, to meet those partners' needs. But from the front side, what that would look like is really inviting a piece of the community to let them know that there is capital. That's why we're calling it the Hendersonville Opportunity Fund, to, to generate the sense of, of sort of hope and promise that there is actually funding available for folks who have maybe felt like funding has not been available before. But in, in the way that, that um, any entrepreneur could walk in off the street from Hendersonville and, and inquire for a loan at Mountain BizWorks right now, that will continue. So does that help? Yes. From, from, the, um, from the borrower's perspective, they don't even really need to know. We have, we have dozens of places where we can pull the money to connect with the entrepreneur's need based on what their business is, what their capital amount you know, for their loan is, various criteria. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Anything else? No. No. Jamie, did you do you, do you expand your skill set and knowledge base in this process? <laughs> <laughs> I, I already a lot. Every time I tell them, every time I have calls with them, I learn something. Every time I sit down with Angie, I learn a lot. <laughs> um, so absolutely and and it's only the beginning of it and so i'm i'm really looking forward to to learning more and doing more um as part of this okay thank you all right uh any discussion or a motion and i think i think the the last line we need to change the name from investment initiative to opportunity fund yeah that was kind of a last minute yeah. it was a good last minute change You doing it? Okay. Madam Mayor, I move that there is that I move to adopt the resolution by the City of Hendersonville, Henderson, Hendersonville City Council to direct the city manager to negotiate a contract with the with the grant project partners to establish the <coughs> opportunity investment initiative as presented. Okay, the, the Downtown Business Opportunity Fund. Oh, that, what? Downtown okay. Opportunity yeah. Fund. Fund. Yep. Oh, okay. okay. All right. Is there any discussion? Not. Those in favor of the resolution say aye. 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 Those opposed say no. Ayes have it. Okay. Nice work. Great. Thank you. Right. Uh, next, resolution um, for a contract with the North Carolina Association of Chiefs of Police. Yes. Mayor Vogt, members of the City Council, uh, as you are aware, um, the City of Henderson was involved in a, a lawsuit with the O'Neill family associated with an uh, incident with one of our canines where Mr. O'Neill was severely bitten. Um, council is aware that we um, were settled that lawsuit with the 
help of our um, insurance company um, in the amount of $1,750,000. Um, that case has been settled and a very sincere apology associated with that incident. Um, now that the case has been settled, um, Chief Myhan and Ms. Speaker and I sat down and had a conversation about what's the next steps to, to prevent anything like this from ever happening again um, and really look at the details of what led to, to this um, tragic event. So we have bringing a proposal to you where the city would um, contract with the North Carolina Association of Chiefs of Police to come in and do a, a deep dive a review of the incident and everything that led up to the incident and the immediate aftermath of the incident um, to generate a report for for staff and that we can present to the city council um, um, that that some of that report um, will get the report some of it will be public record some of it will not um, because it will involve other uh, some of our employees from a personnel matter but um, we would like to engage the former chief of police um, from Hickory um, through the association as well as um, two other canine experts um, to really go through and, and provide this this report to the to the uh, management team and to the city council so we offer that um, and ask that you um, move to adopt the resolution authorizing the mayor to enter into the contract um, with the North Carolina Association of Chief of Police any questions yes mm -hmm. I'm not sure to whom I should direct this question so since there's three people listed here I'll just ask it um, <coughs> Um, the term was just used the aftermath of the incident um, is the goal or, or is this act, uh, this study going to look at for example the day after what should have been done yes okay so not looking at what has happened in the years since then but what should have been happened the day after this happened yes okay other questions Not if we could have a motion. I move that the city council adopt the resolution authorizing Mayor Volk to enter into a contract with the North Carolina Association of Chiefs of Police. Is there any discussion? No. Those in favor of the resolution say aye. Aye. Those opposed to the resolution say no. The ayes have it. Motion carries. We'll move forward with that. Thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, third item of, Can we just of new vote? business, parking ordinance amendments and adoption of official city parking no, no, map. I know that. All no, right. I know we need to do it. <coughs> Good evening. Good evening. For the last time in a long time, <laughs> I, I come to you to, I uh, hope, uh, last time in a long time, to discuss the parking ordinance and the parking map. <clears throat> Just, I want to, at, the, at your request, um, briefly go through uh, the presentation that we went through on Wednesday to summarize for the public information and education uh, a little bit of what the ordinance contains. I forget I have to do this, okay. All right, so briefly, there are three parking zones, metered on street, paid zones off street, and unmetered zones. Metered on street parking zones, that's Main Street and the avenues. It is paid parking, but again, you're paying the meter at the rate of $2 an hour. Parking for less than 30 minutes will be free, no meter fee. But if you park 31 minutes, you have to pay for that first 30 minutes in addition. So you'll get charged the full hour because time is charged in one hour increments. And you guys stop me if I'm going too fast. In the paid parking zones, <clears throat> you have interior lots, exterior lots, and the parking deck. For the interior lots, you have mixed lots where people can park either by permit or hourly. The rate is $1.50 an hour. Parking an hour or less, no charge, but if you kick over to that 61st minute, you'll get charged for the first and the second hour, $3. There are EV spaces that will be limited to three hours. There's also permit only zones where in the, for the interior paid lots, um, and that is 24 seven permit parking only. <clears throat> 
The exterior lots, right now we only have one, and that's Dogwood, and it is gonna be permit only Monday through Saturday. Sunday, it'll be open to the public, free and no time limit. Parking deck, <clears throat> let me go back, back up and say for the um, mixed lot and the metered zone that we were just talking about, uh, from 9 a.m. to 7 p.m., there will be charge for parking, but after seven and on Sundays, no charge and no time limit. For the parking deck, though, it's uh, really charge all the time. Uh, the first hour will be free. If you, again, go into that 61st minute, you'll get charged for the first hour and the second hour. So in other words, it'll be $3. Um, it is also mixed in that there is gonna be some permit parking in the deck. Um, one important thing to know is that it is $10 per parking session. I think on Wednesday, you know, we were talking about $10 per day, but it's really $10 max per parking session. So if you are still parked there at 4 a.m., a new parking session starts at 4 a.m., a new day. So <clears throat> if you have already accrued your max $10 fee and you're still there at 4 a.m., your hourly charge will kick in again. So it's $10 per parking session, okay? Just as a clarification from Wednesday. Um, we do have, and this is the meat of everything, and this is really why I'm, I'm standing up here. I want to turn it over to Ben Alamong, who is the architect of an interactive parking map. And really, it summarizes everything that I've said together with the map. So if people have questions, that's the first place that they should go to see what the parking rules really are. So, Thank you, and good evening. Um, the interactive parking map can be found on the main parking webpage on the city's website under interactive parking map. And that will take you to the ArcGIS web map viewer. Nothing much has changed uh, since we presented it last week, um, but we did add landing pages um, or direct links to all the landing pages that are found on the main parking page here. Um, so the user can go and they can, if they have any questions, direct them to the frequently asked question page. Um, but the map itself, you can use on either your uh, mobile device or laptop. Um, and just, you can scroll through and see all the numbered parking spots of the different on-street parking. Um, those are labeled with the number of spots available just to keep things a little less cluttered. Um, when you zoom in, the labels will appear. Uh, we have information of the park mobile zone number for each of the lots that have them, whether or not they're permit only. The location of accessible parking is still one icon per spot, except for the parking deck, just to keep some clutter down. Um, it's denoted with three EV spots, seven accessible handicap, and there is one shared spot that is both um, that we wanted to keep separate. We have the payment kiosk locations outlined in green to go with the theme of Park Mobile. And if the user is on their mobile device, it'll be basically the same. Um, it's just slightly condensed down to fit a mobile screen. So there will be a splash screen that will show the first time you use either map. And again, you have the legend and that you can close and that opens up the uh, website or the direct links to the website. Uh, the user can navigate just like they would Google Maps, Apple Maps, anything like that. And they can have their location accessible and turned on and it'll be shown by the blue dot that's used in most mapping applications. Um, so when they're actually downtown, if they don't know where the closest kiosk is, they can be directed that way and see all the information just as they would on their laptop. Um, that's all, if you have any questions. Thank you. I have one. Sure. Uh, the, the, what is the term for the number? The parking area? Zone. Zone. Is the parking zone for Main Street and all the avenues the same number? 
Yes. And what um, is that number? Thank you. And that is donated <laughs> here in the legend. Yeah. All right, that's the one I need to know. And also in the legend, there are still the asterisks next to the metered spots and the parking deck and interior lot, which can all be found within the legend as well. Okay. All right. Okay, thank you. Um, <clears throat> so just a few, um, I, I promised I would go over um, what will get you a ticket and what will get you mm -hmm. towed really quickly. Um, so just these are some of the general rules of parking that we've talked about. Um, but this will get you a parking ticket. No backing into spaces, no pull through parking, no parking against traffic. This will also get you a ticket. Stay in the parking lines. Mm -hmm. uh, illegally parking in a handicapped spot. Forgetting to extend your paid parking time or forgetting to check in. You have to check in wherever you park. Parking longer than is permitted within a limited time zone or entering the long, wrong license plate number. These things will get you a ticket. These things will get you towed, as you would expect, if you park in a, uh, if you block a driveway or too close to a fire hydrant. The big one is the habitual violations. We are really cracking down on habitual violators. If you have six or more parking tickets in a six-month period, and that's a rolling six-month period, you're going to be classified habitual. We are starting everybody with a clean slate. <laughs> Because uh, we do have people that would meet that criteria already, but because we've changed the rules, we're starting everybody with a clean slate. Um, so six or more parking tickets or three unpaid outstanding parking tickets will get you classified as a habitual violator, and then your fine will be increased by $100 for every violation. And that really goes with the car, the, light, the plate, doesn't it? It goes Not with the, the plate. It goes with the plate, although if... I, if it could be tagged to the same person, that person would get uh, to be classified as a habitual violator. So the way it's set up, owner or operator um, will get the ticket. And so the owner, the operator is usually not there, right? And so they run the tag, whoever it's registered to, that is who gets the ticket. But if I have two cars, which like me, I have three cars, <laughs> mine and my kids' cars, right? So I could get a habitual violation if all three of my cars had tickets and I didn't pay the tickets for all three of my cars. Does that make sense? Mm. So. No, it makes sense. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, we do. We are implementing an informal review process for tickets um, to so that if somebody can show that they were actually in compliance or that that was issued in error. Um, like, for instance, maybe somebody misentered a tag and so the ticket went to somebody who really lives in Raleigh and has never even been to Hendersonville. We, we have gotten some calls like that. So if they can show that, then of course the ticket would be set aside. Um, if denied, then payment is owed within that same 30 days or you will get assessed another $100 penalty. Yes, sir. The five-day review, does that start tomorrow? It starts tomorrow, yes. So you have five days from the date the ticket is issued or served on you, which is the latest. Usually that's going to be the same day because we serve it by leaving it on the vehicle. Okay. Um, so since Wednesday, um, I have made one addition just based on feedback I've gotten from the community about the ordinance. Um, and that is to add a provision about loitering in the parking deck. So I have added um, some provision to say that basically the parking deck is to be used for parking, going to and from your car, um, or if we have a special event, it would be for that. If you are there um, for an unauthorized purpose, like a, a group of people hanging out, um, listening to music upstairs at midnight on the highest level, um, the police are authorized to order you to leave. And if you are unauthorized and you refuse to leave, then you'll be deemed a trespasser and can be removed. So that's what we've added. Other than that, the, it's what was in the agenda packet um, originally. So I handed out the 
one with that addition um, for you. Will that only be enforced if there are complaints, or is that going to be regularly patrolled? Because <laughs> I think the general consensus is people don't want folks sleeping and that kind of stuff. In right. So, so, I mean, I think it's going to have to be both, really, mm -hmm. but I'll let the chief address that. All of our vehicles now are equipped with a card to be able to gain access to the to the park lot so it will be part of patrols i don't know the the regularity of the frequency of those patrols but it will be something that we will uh that will patrol we we have access to the cameras that are in the in the parking deck but they're the way that it's set up it's really a review it's not a live stream watching all the time thing that the system that is in there does not really it's not really i guess set up for that so uh, we won't be able to really watch it and say, hey, there's people hanging out. So we're going to be relying on people to call us when those things are happening. But uh, after hours and on weekends, we'll, we'll, you'll see an increased presence in the parking garage. And of course, the parking folks will be through there very regularly, and they will inform us if they, have, if they see something that is, they see it as a violation. But. Okay. Other questions? I have one. Uh, okay. For the yeah. Public, this is for Angie. When someone gets a parking ticket, that money does not come to the city of Hendersonville. It does. Oh, my fault. It does. It does because it's been decriminalized. Okay. Was there a time when it didn't? Um, I'm not sure, but the way okay. we've written it now, it's completely decriminalized. And um, so, yes, the money will come. As long as we're citing them for a violation of our ordinance. If it's a state infraction, no. Okay, that's what I have confused. Right. Mm -hmm. State but infraction, it goes to the state. That's correct. Right, okay. Um, <clears throat> as part of adopting the ordinance, you're also going to be adopting the map. That's why I have the, I was so excited to see this at the deck. I was like, I want to use that. <laughs> so Brandy brought it over for me. I appreciate that. But so you're actually, it's in the ordinance to approve the, the map, and it's actually maintained online. So the hot data is the real map. This is just a paper representation of it. All right. Uh, Mr. Meek, we're almost through, and, and you can come up and ask your question when, when we're, we're finished. We just have a couple minutes to go. Well, okay. Uh, any other questions? Someone would like to uh, make a motion? Madam Mayor, I move City Council to adopt an ordinance to amend Chapter 50, Traffic, Articles 4, Traffic Control Devices, and Article 5, Stopping, Standing, and Parking, of the City of Hendersonville Code of Ordinances, and to adopt the official city parking map designating parking zones as presented. Is there any discussion? Not. Those in favor of... Uh, Amending the ordinances, say aye. Aye. Those opposed say no. Ayes have it. Whew. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, really better be the last time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyone have anything they want to bring up? Yes. Yeah. I would like to thank whoever in Public Works worked on the parking area across from Jen's office in front of the high school to repaint and put a spot there. I just want to say thank you to whoever did that, those employees, and of course, city manager and head of public works. That created one more parking spot for everybody, and I, we appreciate it. Okay. Thank you. Anything else? I have a quick comment. Yeah. Um, this month at the NPO meeting, we are um, voting on uh, project swaps, and this is the the time well because you know the state was out of money like roughly eight, 11 billion dollars and so we had to cut down projects and so we have requested that um we swap out the canuga road project so that we can have the 64 interchange um fixed so that's the I feel like the general consensus okay. so just wanted to give everybody a heads up about that one all right anything else um are, are we at some point announcing the um, wastewater grants that we've received? I was thinking we were doing that tonight, but then I... Oh, we're still waiting official notification. Is that... Okay. Yes. Um, yeah, we don't have official... It was just voted on this past meeting, and then we just voted on it. Yeah. Uh, okay. We'll make sure we get Mike here to do a, okay. a, 
a, a, a presentation on how that money, the money and how we're going to spend it. Okay. All right. But okay. But teaser, we've uh, gotten some very nice grants that you can uh, be looking forward to soon. Uh, all right. Uh, city manager report. Uh, simply uh, just point out uh, uh, reporting surplus items has been surplus in the last month according to our policy that is included in your agenda packet also remind council of our council staff retreat next Thursday evening and all day Friday you do have a homework um, that attached to the last Hendersonville Herald there's four questions to prep you for Friday so please do your homework bring it with you but um, it will be helpful if you do it before you get there. So thank you. If you need another copy of that, I'll be glad to provide it. Okay. All right. Thank you. And there is a request for a closed session. Madam Mayor, I move that City Council, City Council, enter closed session pursuant to North Carolina General Statute 143-318.11A1 and 5 to prevent the disclosure of information that is privileged or confidential pursuant to the law of this state or of the United States or not considered a public record within the meaning of Chapter 132 of the General Statutes and to establish or to instruct the public body staff or negotiating agents concerning the position to be taken by or on behalf of the public body in negotiating the price and other material terms of a contract or proposed contract for the acquisition of real property by purchase, option, exchange, or lease. Thank you. Is there any discussion? Not those in favor of entering closed session say aye. Aye. As opposed to say no. Ayes have to will.